Yeah. All right. Okay. We're being recorded. I hope I look good. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and the few gentlemen that we have. You are all welcome, whether ladies or gentlemen. Welcome to the first district conference on empowering girls, a project which is initiated by none other than the Rotary International President himself, Sheikha Mehta. Let me just uh, share screen as to what's going to happen on my side. Uh, right. Okay. Can you see this? Can you see? To say a little bit about myself, I'm the conference organizing chair, as appointed by DG Dolly. As past, I am past president of the Rotary Club of Singapore, which has been appointed as host club for this conference. I am one of the assistant district uh, uh, assistant uh, empowering ambassador for empowering girls, together with uh, Dato uh, PP. Dato Tarsha. It's a long Tarsia. description, so it's so difficult to say. My anyway, name is Tarsha. Yeah, Tarsha. Okay. Yeah. I was past uh, chair of the district alumni group and my past vocation. I used to be executive search consultant and management consultant. Our support team today, our support team today are, uh, let's see, we have Jacqueline, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Cole, uh, Rotarian ja Jessica Lim. Noisy. Uh, okay. Just unmute. Just unmute. Okay. We have uh, Rotarian Ong Ting Yong, myself, and President Lewis is also going to come a little bit. Just a little bit of the Zoom rules that we have. This is primarily for the participants, but uh, some are for the speakers as well. So please mute yourself. Um, we can all mute ourselves now for the time being, but please show your video to enable the organizers to identify each and every one of us. Make use of the virtual background created for this conference. So there's a nice uh, uniformity. Use the rename button if you haven't done so yet to include your uh, name and your uh, affiliation and organization. Use the chat button for comments and sessions and, and questions during the sessions uh, to enable the speakers to review the questions so you can answer them. They can answer you, sorry, uh, during the sessions themselves using the chat as well. Or maybe if we have time at the Q&A, do use the raise hands on Zoom and subject time constraints. This, uh, you may be asked to speak. Unmute yourself only if asked to by the moderator. Okay. Um, and uh, your e-certificates of attendance will be provided to those who complete the session. So please show your video at all times. We shall also have photo taking sessions twice, one in the middle and at the end. So the session is being recorded for record keeping and for club promotion on social media. By participating in this event, you consent to photography, audio recording, video recording, their release publication or exhibit as Rotary Club of Singapore or representatives deem fit to use. Let me now go to a intro short introduction of our moderator and for the afternoon. It's past president Dato, Dr. Haja Tarsha Taman. It's not complete, but I hope that's good enough. Okay. <laughs> She's past, enough. President, uh, past president of the Rotary Club of Kita Kinabali, Kota Kinabalu Pearl, consisting of all ladies all lady Rotarians in that club. She is chairperson for District 3310 Community Services, and she is one of the assistant ambassadors for Empowering Girls as well. She is a training and motivational speaker and chairman chairperson of the Saba Women's Advisory Council. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Dr. PP Dato Hasha. Okay, Hasha. <laughs> Over Thank to you. you so much. Thank you so Over much, you. past president. Yeah, past president Perlita Tiro. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, I will be uh, sort of the MC and of course the moderator for this conference. PP Perlita had already outlined the rules and protocols of the conference 
and I hope we will have a very smooth presentation and transition during the several sections of this conference. Let me remind again, please mute your audio, but turn on your video. Random photography will be carried out and we hope all participants will stay until the closure of this conference. To start the session proper, let us call upon District 3310 Governor, Ms. Dolly Yip, to give her welcoming remarks. Digi Dolly has been a Rotarian for 21 years, joining the Rotary Club of Kulai, Johor, Malaysia in 2001. She holds the honor of being elected as the first female governor of District 3310. Her long list of achievements within Rotary is topped by her record as district chair of the End Polio campaign, whereby the district was the highest contributor to Polio Plus in Zone 6B for three consecutive years. DG Dolly holds a Bachelor of Arts from University of Winnipeg, Canada, and a diploma in hotel management from Switzerland. DG Dolly, you are welcome remarks, please. Thank you, our moderator, Dato, Dr. Tasha. Good afternoon, to, uh, my dear friends and here today. Um, I can see everyone's very excited about today. So I would like to uh, give my speech now. Girls, girls, girls. I was once a girl and I'm the youngest in the family of eight. There are six girls and two boys. Yes, and at that era, most of the family wish for boys. Boy inherited the names of the family and it carries the name of the family root. But time has changed and this is no longer a whole truth in many situations or in many families. Organizing chairperson, past president Pelita, past president, um, Sorry, President Louis Lim, President of the Rotary Club of Singapore, the Host Club, Past Rotary International Director Sawalak, Ambassadors for Empowering Girls, Ambassador for Zone 10B and 10C, thank you for your presence today. Past District Governor Kapana, a dear friend from District 3240, Yang Babahagia Dato Rosie Nani, Director of Health Sabah, Rotarian Edin. Past district governors, all distinguished panels, my dear fellow Rotarians, Rotractors, Interactors, teacher advisors, and friends of Rotary from far and near. I'm proud that Rotary, through the initiative of our Rotary International President, Sheikh Amita, has put a special emphasis to these pertaining issues of girls, empowering girls. There is now growing movements in many countries to empowering girls for a better tomorrow. When families, communities, and the whole societies start supporting girls and creating an environment in which they can thrive, we create a generation of empowered girls who will become empowered movement of tomorrow. This is indeed befitting to me as the first woman governor of my district. I'm empowered to give prominence of to issues affecting girls and women. To this, I too have dedicated special emphasis to this issue when, where in my district goals, each club is to have at least one activity or project related to girls. Despite the pandemic, we are able to carry out several activities relating to girls, either virtually or physically, and one such activity was about menstruation, the making of reusable sanitary pad, open talks about what are the problems faced by girls and the importance of educating for them, or of education for them. We are lucky to receive our tertiary education or in some part of the world, girls do not get a chance to enter school. Today, we have planned an exciting program for all of you. We have invited prominent speakers, including young interactors, road tractors, and students from different regions share with us 
their knowledge and experiences of their respective region. I'm excited to hear from all of them. My heartiest, my heartiest thanks to all speaker, speaker for giving us their time and preparations for this conference. To all our participation participants, I thank you for joining us on this Saturday afternoon. I'm touched by your presence and hope that, that you enjoy the sessions ahead. I wish to thank our host club, the Rotary Club of Singapore, for agreeing to host this event. Thank you to all members of the organizing committee. My salute to especially organizing chair Palita, who is also one of the empowering girls, ambassador, the moderator, uh, and the other empowering girls, ambassador Dato Dato Tashia, Rotarians Ong Ting Yong with the flyers. She has designed very nice flyers to attract our participants today, and Rotarian Jacqueline Ko and all who assisted in making this conference a success. And also, I would also like to thank our president, uh, Audrey Chan, and the, uh, and the district committee too, in their input to this uh, today's uh, empowerment uh, conference. And I must thank the advisor, past district governor, Dr. Zaini, for his dedication to this conference, who wants this conference to be of this level and skill. So thank you to everyone. Let's just have a good afternoon. Just relax and listen and relearn about empowering girls. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Governor Dolly Yip, for an inspiring speech. OK, um, I'm still within the time limit, um, uh, OC, <laughs> Pipi Perlita. Let us now call upon past Rotary International Director, Dr. Sawalak Ratanavich, who is the ambassador for empowering girls in zones 10B and 10C, where District 3310 belongs. Toto Sawala is from Thailand, has been a Rotarian since 1990, and had served many senior positions within Rotary International. She is the recipient of Rotary International Top Awards, that is the Service Above Staff Award, and the Rotary Foundation Citation for Meritorious Service Award. Dr. Sawala is a so why no song on? Hello? Oh, I thought somebody said that. Sorry, okay, please Dr. go Sawala ahead. Please. Is uh, Dr. Sawala is a retired professor in the Faculty of Education, but still serves as a special expert of the Graduate School Board at Sri Nakarin Virat University in Bangkok, Thailand. I hope I pronounce it correctly, Dr. Sawalak. <laughs> PRID, Dr. Sawalak, please deliver your speech as the Zone Ambassador for Empowering Girls. Thank you, Dr. Dato. Well, organizing chair, past president, Pertilla, district governor, Dolly, fellow Lotarians, Lotarector, interactors, and distinguished guests. Good afternoon, Sawadika. It is a great pleasure for me to be with you this afternoon for the uh, District 3310 conference on empowering girls for a, sustain a sustainable future. I would like to thank uh, this Governor Dolly Yip and the organizing chair to kindly inviting me to this important event. Well, as all you know that one major global problem today is one to 20 year old and the privileged girl in need due to poverty and injustice in society. Millions of girls have been facing their own life destination, struggling for a living in poor family without a sufficient ability to help themselves. Various problems cause their suffering, including issues relating to health, hygiene, child labor exploitation, violence, bullying, sexual harassment, child marriage, adolescent pregnancy, and even rights for basic education and literacy. RI President Shega has realized the significance of low international responses to tackle this global problem. So he has presented an initiative for empowering, uh, uh, initiative for empowering underprivileged girls who are in various situations, localities, and communities. 
This approach represents the organization's main service aim for all members, cooperation globally to raise awareness and increase cooperation of families, communities, and other government or private organization to take significant action for solving this issue. Well, during the last six to seven months in the zones 10B and C, under a goal of 100% of club involvement, lots of things have been done with the leadership of ambassador team comprising assistant ambassador, leader of club district, district committees, and low track clubs. You can see well, all of these people, you know, are all all, all works they they all work so hard assistant empowering and that teams right yep and the son 10 b and c could reach the goal involvement to help girls in need you look at the report the final report as of uh, uh last month you know, at the end of march well the son 10 b and c could reach the goals of club involvement to help the girls in need, irrespective of each project size, as shown in the final report as of the end of March, you can see that. Well, we can still have time to go to the 100%, right? And well, hence these girls, you see all the unprivileged girls will be provided with more opportunity and hope in changing their life for a better and the solution and the relevant activities can be publicized throughout the region and the world via social media, such as Loti Showcase and Facebook. Dear friends, well, today I'm very much confident that a conference will lead us in the right track to take action in different areas of problem to ensure that the underprivileged girls are offered hope and motivation so that they can be more resilient in standing on their own feet to uh, their own feet to head their family and confidently become important leaders of our society in the future. Dear friends, I appreciate very much for your great effort, kindness, and concerns to the girls in need. And I wish you success and all the best in the conference and in your life. Certainly, many more millions of girls are waiting for their hope from us, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much, PRID Dr. Sawala. She has even shared some of the girls' empowerment activities in uh, some of the areas covered by our zone uh, under the girls' empowerment. Thank you again, Dr. Sawalak. With pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah, you're most welcome. Our next speech is from our guest of honor, none other than the Rotary International President, Shekha Mehta. President Sheka has realized the significance of Rotary's responses to tackle the global problem involving 60 million girls who have not received basic education and two thirds of the world's 960 million illiterates are girls. This year, President Sheka has adopted the global initiative for empowering under privileged girls in various situations, localities, or communities. President Sheka is unable to be with us this afternoon because he is currently attending board meetings in Evanston, Illinois, USA, where the Rotary headquarters is. Let us now listen to his recorded speech. Technical team, please share the speech. Somebody else is using the, the speech. Okay. Hey, Makai. Yes. Yes. 
Eva, can you unmute yourself? Uh, we can't hear the, the video. Yes, we can hear, can't hear. Technical team, please uh, redo the video, the recorded speech. In this very special year of your life, I therefore urge you to dream big. Start small start and think of how the, the work you do can be translated to a large scale. With can you see? No. Ever since I joined Rotary, service above self has been the North Star of my life. My first encounters with service Everything were through the club projects, okay. eye camps, tree plantations, food distribution drives. These were my first rotary dates. Service is our core value. It is our DNA. In this very special year of your life, I therefore urge you to dream big. Start small, serve locally, and think of how the work you do can be translated to a large scale with deep impact. <laughs> Find a need and plan a solution, but never stop thinking about the big picture. When our clubs join hands together, the result is impactful projects that leave a long lasting impact on the community, city, or even the country. In India, we call it Vasudeva Kutumbakam, meaning the world is a family, serve it well. As we go about doing good in the world, let empowering girls. Too many girls face discrimination, disadvantage. They lack opportunities. Empowering girls will mean securing their education, securing their health, their economic development, equipping them with skills for greater opportunities. It will mean curbing child marriage and teenage pregnancies. It will mean preventing trafficking and abuse and gender-based violence against women. Adolescent girls have a right to a safe, educated and healthy life. We know that when girls are supported and encouraged, starting at the youngest ages, they have the potential to change the world, both as empowered girls of today and as tomorrow's workers, mothers, entrepreneurs and leaders. An investment in them upholds their rights today and promises a more equitable and prosperous future. One in which half of humanity is an equal partner in solving the problems of climate change, political conflict, economic growth, disease prevention and global sustainability. There is so much that can be done to serve to change lives of girls. So during this special year of yours, remember what Gandhi said. The best way to find yourself is to lose in the service of others. And what Martin Luther King Jr. asked, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Dear Rotarians, let our answer be, we will serve to change lives. Because service to humanity is good for both body and soul. How do I stop share? Oh, yeah. How do I stop share? Oh, there, there, there. Got, got it. Got it. Yeah. Somebody muted me. What an inspiring speech from our President Shekhar. Thank yes. you, President Shekhar, um, for a wonderful speech. I hope everyone um, listens to the speech just now. Um, now, we have already come to the session on sharing of experiences, issues, and even challenges as well as recommendation on the three topics of the conference. The main speaker is given less than 90 minutes while the panel speaker is given less than nine minutes in their presentation. I will interject 
two minutes prior to the time lapse if necessary. The question and answer session will be addressed after the end of each topic. Only five minutes are allotted. So we suggest that the, the question be typed in the chat box. I will select relevant questions and forward to the relevant speakers for their responses. Of course, the speakers can also respond directly in the chat box. Are we ready now for the first topic? Okay, the first topic is on education and career development. There will be one main speaker and four panel speakers. Our main speaker on this topic is Rotarian Iman Jamal Idin from the Rotary Club of Singapore. She is currently working as the country head of customer success in Microsoft, Microsoft Singapore. Ms. Iman has lived and worked in France, Japan, and Morocco before coming to Singapore eight years ago. Originally from Morocco and speaks fluent Japanese, Ms. Iman obtained her master's degree in electrical and communication engineering on scholarship from Tohoku University in Japan. Iman's inspiration to innovate stems from her deep cultural integration and diverse yet inclusive approach to people across different business functions. Over to you, Ms. Iman. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Haja Tarsia, and thank you everyone for, uh, for listening to the talk today. Let me just share my screen where, while uh, uh, I share with you the, uh, my, uh, my speech for the day. So um, I, when, uh, when we discussed uh, with the organizer about education and career development, um, there are two ways of taking it. Either we take uh, a generic uh, education and career uh, discussion, and that may take hours, if not days, to just address the topic, or taking it from a little bit a personal aspect, and therefore uh, going with my journey and sharing with you here, girls and boys and, and young talent uh, and students, uh, how I came up uh, in, in my own journey, and what are the tips that you could take on to further your own journeys and your own uh, careers? Uh, and I love the picture here. Every one of you, whether you are in junior high or high school or students or starting your careers, please think and believe that each one of you is unique. Each one of you is bold. Each one of you is fearless. And, and uh, the speech today is, is to share with you my journey, but that's not the only journey or the only example. There are multiple examples and the leaders here uh, that have uh, shared and talked just now, each one of, you, of them has their own journeys. So I hope that if I can, you know, encourage and inspire some of you, uh, that will be the goal for, uh, for today for me. So starting from, uh, for, I will share about three aspects or three milestones in, in my talk today. The first milestone is junior uh, is my junior or early education. And my education was in Morocco. I'm born in Casablanca in Morocco. And I had my early education there. And I will share with you in my next slide. But at 18 years old, uh, something that a defining moment in my life uh, is when I had the Japanese scholarship to go to Japan and study engineering in Japanese. And uh, at that point in time, at 18 years old, and that's 22 years ago, uh, I didn't speak English, let alone Japanese. And I packed my thing at 18, uh, getting my passport for the first time and, and heading to Japan. So I will share about my higher education and what I are the, the tips or advices and key takeaways uh, that I want to, you to have a takeaway with. And then last but not least, the last point is on career development. And uh, life brought me from Japan to France to Singapore. Uh, and my career honestly has flourished in, in Singapore, which I'm grateful for the opportunities that they give to female and, and the meritocracy that there is here in Singapore when it comes to leadership. So the first one, the first milestone that I mentioned I will talk about is 
uh, early in career. And uh, I have three three takeaways or three uh, pointers. When looking back in in my early in career in Morocco, the first point is to be curious. It's always curiosity and hunger for learning, and instead of study for exam. When you study for exam or when you think that the exam is the most thing that matters, you have anxiety as young girl and boys, you have mental health issues, and, and it can backfire. And on top of it, maybe after the exam, you forget what you learned. But when you have a frame it in a mindset of hungry for learning, being really curious, the learning that you got and that you picked up from from the education stays with you uh, as long as you live and that's really something that shaped my my education throughout i was very curious it's always for me learning i was so excited to go to school and uh, exam for me is an afterthought uh, about the learnings so that's the first one the second one is find subjects to love it's, it's really interesting because uh, sometimes as students in junior high and high school, we don't think about loving subjects. We just want to learn and, and, and study and get the exam and move to the next year and move to the next year. Um, what made the journey very, very pleasant and joyful for me is that I, I knew that I loved mathematics and I put Pythagoras here but I love everything about maths ge geometry and and chemi and uh, uh, algebra and analytics and on the flip side I also loved literature especially French classic literature so I put v Victor Hugo and Emile Zola there they were one of my best authors and the last philosophy because it helped me with being curious and wanting to learn I understood uh, that uh, there are the world is not around what we know, but the world is very much around what we don't know and what we don't know yet. And there is no right or wrong answer in philosophy. So it gives the mind the, the uh, op opportunity and the chance to think and, and to wonder and to be curious and to learn. Um, so it's very important as you, uh, when you are going in your education, one, to frame it as a learning uh, and not an exam and two, find things that you love. It doesn't need to be math, literature, or philosophy. It could be art. It could be history. It could be geography. Something, the, the love of that subject will, will allow you to be curious because you want to know everything about that subject. And the last point, which is really important, and I, I, I encourage everyone who's listening as well to think about it, is getting extra activities that are outside of school or within the school after, uh, after education. One of them is theater. So I had a mini theater career uh, for uh, 10 years in, in Morocco. Theater helped me with uh, my speaking helped me with my presence, helped me uh, not being worried or uh, fearful of speaking to hundreds of people and helped me manage my emotions as well. Poetry, debate is something that I really encourage the young generation who are listening to me now because it helps you understanding uh, the other person, understanding the uh, multiple thought processes, and also understanding how, uh, how you can be empathic and how to use logic and how to use uh, how to leverage logic moving forward. The last but not least, which is really interesting, is my father thought that I was uh, very bookish and, and that I spent so much time reading and writing poetry and all. So he squeezed karate uh, in order for me to have some physical activities and, and be less bookish uh, on, on my learning. But uh, it's, not, uh, it's not just uh, uh, for me here, but it's really uh, to looking back, those are really key pointers that help the girls being empowered and have the girl, help the girls flourish. Uh, because we love learning, we, lo we love being being curious and and we need to uh, to do a lot of things outside of school 
So if we go to the key takeaways of my early education, life is not only school. Uh, having a home and uh, having a, a, live, a loving home and a warm home is very, very important. Also community, uh, working in the community as a young age, um, Casablanca, uh, have many street children, have many underprivileged communities. So working with the communities kept me grounded uh, and made me understand at a very young age how privileged uh, I was to have a highly educated parent who were nurturing and encouraging in their education. Having So I again, I encourage the young generation here to really look into community. And the last point when it comes to, to life in early education, please build deep friendships. You don't need to be the most popular uh, girl in the class. You don't need to have thousands of followers in Instagram. You need only few deep friendships and deep connections that helps you navigate your education and navigate your journey. And I tell you the friendships built in, in high school and uh, junior school and high school are still with me right now. I am still deeply connected to the friends that I built uh, 20 years ago. And I wasn't the most popular uh, kid in the class, but I have really strong friends to nurture. The parents who are listening to me today in my talk, please support uh, the students and support your, your girls and boys. Uh, having trust, support, and encouragement is very, very important. I was blessed to have two parents who are both in education. So my mom was a math teacher, my dad was French teacher, hence my love for math and for, and for French, uh, thanks to the DNA they gave me. But it's very, very important to encourage the kids and give them a voice. If they say that they love a subject, then they really love that subject. So encourage them in finding their love, finding their passion, and finding their curiosity. The last point of early uh, education, which will bring me to, to my Japanese studies, is being flexible and open to options. It's very good to have, um, uh, to have a, a, an objective or a goal uh, when you are young, uh, but it, in the same time, it's also, you can be open into looking into other options. For example, uh, for uh, junior high, I, I really, adamantly wanted to be an astronaut and work in the NASA in the USA. And then at 18 years old, uh, I had the scholarship from Japan that was not expected at all. I was selected uh, to go to Japan. And uh, that will change the whole trajectory of me not going to the USA to become an astronaut, but going to Japan to study uh, in a Japanese university. And I was very open about it. And I think that's the best decision I made uh, because I went um, to Japan, whereas many, many Moroccans go to Europe. So it was something different uh, and being bold and taking a risk there. Uh, if I go to the next uh, slide, which is on higher education, that's Again, the, uh, the decision that I made of going to Japan instead of uh, going to the US or going to Europe, the picture down here in, is Kansai, and, uh, and that's the uh, Osaka University for Foreign uh, Studies, and that's the Japanese Language Center. I studied there exactly in that, in that building, uh, six hours a day, every day, Japanese language, because I needed to have the same level of fluency in Japanese because I will study uh, my higher education in a Japanese language. It wasn't uh, easy. It was really, really tough. The different culture, different mindset, uh, understanding where I can be. So it was uh, an, a very um, difficult uh, journey, but very rewarding journey. And then from there, I went to Tohoku University, which is the top picture here. It's, called, it's written in Japanese character, Tohoku Gaidai. And I went to Tohoku University to further my bachelor and master uh, in engineering. I have three pointers that made me uh, navigate the university and higher education, um, had a higher education journey. The first of what, the first of it is really simple. It's okay to fail. I know that the younger generation, and I was one of you, uh, is we want to have everything perfect. We want to make the best decisions, and that gives us anxiety and worry. What if we don't do well? What if we fail? 
that's okay. That's what youth is all about. Uh, I failed in a sense. I went to um, to study math because I thought that was my uh, further education. But at the end of the day, instead of studying math, I found out that I wanted to study engineering. So I switched from math to engineering. So it's very important to, to feel and understand that it's okay to fail and to try and fail again. Even now in a corporate world, we always say uh, fail fast and learn faster so that's really important it's okay to fail it's okay to change course it's okay to find your way uh, and be intentional on your decisions the second point especially for the student here who wants to study abroad and study in a foreign uh, foreign country or a foreign university create your support system the worst thing that can happen is you thinking that you are alone and that you are on your own, that nobody helps you. What it's a really hard feeling um, when when it comes to that. And that was um, that was a wake up call for me uh, when I started in in uh, in uh, in Osaka University, and I found I was sick uh, for twelve hours with fever, and nobody knocked my door nobody uh, I had no one and and I felt really terrible of my with myself I said I left my family in in uh, in Morocco and uh, here I am uh, 40 degrees of fever and not being able to to have somebody and after that that was the wake-up call for me because I decided that I need to create my own support system I don't need to dwell and and uh, uh, and feel lonely or feel alone find a support system that works for me so that I don't feel alone. And uh, because Moroccan in, uh, in, in Tohoku University, we were only four or five out of hundreds of thousands of people, I found not the Moroccan community because we are small, but the Bangladeshi community. They had there were hundreds of students uh, in Tohoku University, and they I felt a sense of belonging. They uh, included me. They helped me in my education. They showed me uh, which uh, which teacher and which professor and which uh, uh, subject to take. And each support system is different. Uh, ever not only for education but also at work uh, and at at life find your support system you are never alone uh, be intentional on creating your own connection and your own belonging last but not least is is something that um, uh, the first black uh, supreme court justice uh, kitanji brown jackson uh, said when they, she was asked about uh, what advice to give to the younger generation she mentioned persevere and i related to it so much I think what uh, perseverance was my best friend throughout the my education in Japan. The easiest thing I could do is pack my things and go back to Morocco and have an education there and leave my life there. But I didn't want this easy way out. Uh, I wanted, I saw huge opportunities in, in Japan. Uh, it's a beautiful country, uh, work, workplace is great. Uh, and then I decided to persevere. I decided to, to, to grow and succeed uh, and have a grit. So it's very important uh, to, to, to have a perseverance, to have a support system, and to give yourself the choice of failure, to say, um, I, it's okay. Uh, I decided this, it didn't work. Let's move on. Let's find something else. Let's progress and let's grow. The, the final milestone that uh, I have here, and it may take a long time to, to, to present, so I will not present the whole thing. But essentially, when it comes to career, I, I didn't want to only put career, I put life and career, because the personal uh, life and the professional life are interwined. If somebody tells you he, they are separating life and work, I, I don't think it's really 100% true, because especially as girls, especially especially as women, our personal life and our professional life are really much more interwined than men, for example. And, and it, it reflected in whole my career journey, where, for example, I was married in 2004 and I decided to, continue, to stay in Japan because my husband was in Japan and I took my first job as a network engineer. Uh, but then I tell you again about failing and moving uh, and learning. Uh, I, after one year, I found out that I did not want to 
become to be or continue to be a network engineer because my passion is customer facing and international so i moved to become a project manager in uh, in in another company so it's okay you try when you are young you try as many things as possible and then you see what's your passion and what's your purpose in life then in 2009 again when i say life and professional are intertwined when you are woman or when you are a young female talent uh, i was uh, my husband and i decided to leave japan and go to europe so i i resigned from from my job in uh, in japan and i moved with my husband in europe and it was really the best decision again because uh, i had a really wonderful leader and boss in france who decided that he will take a chance on me and give me a leadership role, whereas I was just three years uh, three years old in my working experience. And then life happens again. We decide we uh, we wanted to come to Singapore, and this is when you know when life throws you lemons, you make the best lemonade out of it. I came to Singapore in 2010 with no job, no prospects, whereas I was having a lucrative career in France and my career trajectory in France would have been great. But that doesn't mean anything. You decide that your life is uh, or family is more important. And I started in 2010 in Singapore as a contractor in entry level, being paid the minimum wages that uh, that an employer can give to a contractor in Singapore, very, very low. But I decided that, you know what, one step back, in order to have two, three steps forward. And then within the same company, from 2010 to 2012, I had multiple promotion. I ended up leading hundreds of people, but the entry, I started really from the entry level. It's very important to know as young uh, uh, girls and boys here that you are listening to me, when you think about a successful career, it's not a one line that, that goes all the way up. It goes up and down and left and right, uh, and then it, it takes a hold some time, it stops and then restarts again with a faster pace. Your career is your, you decide what's, what's your career and you write your own career journey. And that's what happened. Uh, I didn't think that I would leave Japan uh, to go to France. I didn't think I would leave France to come to Singapore. But then life and career are intertwined when it comes to career development. And then uh, from for the last eight years, uh, from 2012 to 2020, uh, I, I found that my passion is on being a servant leader and empowering others to achieve more. And, and uh, I, uh, my career progressed in that sense. But in the at the same time, I had two sons, uh, one in 2012, born in 2012, and, and one born in 2015, and I didn't put it here. But again, because life and career are intertwined, uh, when my first son was born, I scaled down from leading hundreds of employees to becoming an individual contributor because I wanted uh, to focus on my family first. So when you say uh, work-life balance, it's really whether you, uh, you prioritize a career at one point in time, you prioritize kids at one point in time, you prioritize yourself at one point in time. It's all a harmony uh, together. It, there is no one size fits all when it comes to career development. And fast forward here in 20, from 2020 to now, I work in Microsoft, but I have a passion, I have a purpose, which is to give back to communities lead with empathy and really empower the next generation like yourself so i'm really excited to be with you today and i will leave you with uh, this final slide uh, just a few words uh, of wisdom when it when it comes to your uh, as especially us as girls the first one be bold uh, be vocal speak up second one take risks you've seen a uh, seen me taking risks in, uh, in in throughout my career most of the time it pays off sometimes it doesn't but uh take a risk is really what helps and uh, you navigate in your uh, in your journey find your passion is very very important and dare to lead uh, we need many many female and woman leadership. We need women to lead and to speak up and to be bold. Persevere is my word of the moment. And finally, live your life with no regrets. And thank you, I leave you with those words. Thank you, Rotary and Iman. <clears throat> Iman has shared her journey and takeaways in her academic and career development. 
she said, be curious. Love your chosen subjects. Take extra activities. Unmute yourself, Dato. Because we had to mute everybody. Okay. Yeah, and including me. <laughs> okay, thank you, Pippi. Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Iman has shared her journey and takeaways in her academic and career development. Um, she also mentioned that, you know, advice us to be curious, love your chosen subjects, take extra activities, create support system, and persevere. She also mentioned she had taken even one step backward, but eventually she has more than two to three steps forward. She, lastly, she also shared with us her work-life balance, which is very important for us as a woman, especially. Once again, thank you, Rotarian Iman. The first panel speaker is a former interactor who studied in Stanford Inter International American School, Singapore. Ms. Jenna Lies is currently doing her Bachelor of Science in Psychology at Bath University. United Kingdom. She had been involved in charity works, including those in Peru and Cambodia. Let us now call upon Ms. Jenna on the importance of extracurricular activities to strengthen a girl's future. Over to you, Ms. Jenna. Thank you, Dr. Tarsha, for having me, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. I'm really excited to share my experiences during high school and now coming on to university. So I'll be talking about how extra activities are very important to shape our futures, not only for our own mental health, but for future education and career prospects. So I grew up in South Africa in Singapore and I completed the international baccalaureate. During my time doing the IB, I was involved in sports, creative activities and um, service activities such as charities. I'm currently studying psychology at the University of Bath and in June I'll be starting as a HR intern at Unilever. So my understanding from a psychology student is that a balanced life is a happy Life. I understand that high school is very stressful, schooling is demanding, we want to perform well, we want to make our families and ourselves proud, but we must also remember that we also have a life outside education. And for me, that was guided by the IB framework CAS, which includes creativity, activity and service. Now CAS provided me with the opportunity to try new things outside of the classroom and to build future skills. So firstly, creativity. I have a love for baking and cooking, but I also know lots of others who take their creative sides through an artistic perspective, such as painting, drawing, and music. My takeaway from this is just to encourage you to be creative, think outside the box. Not only will this help you internally, but it will also create new skill sets that can be transferred to the classroom and to jobs in the future. Secondly, activity. Activity was probably my favorite thing that I've ever done, sport. I was the touch rugby captain at school and now going to university, I've tried to keep up with activity by playing tennis. Not only has sport given me the opportunity to be involved with other people, learning teamwork skills, but to also learn leadership skills. Sports not only is good for your physical health, but also your mental health. The endorphins released in sport is very beneficial and can be a great de-stressor. Lastly, service. I have always loved working with others on different challenges, but I thought in high school, one of my favorite moments had been in service clubs. So I was an interactor in high school. We participated in the book drive and donated some of the money raised to KK um, Women's Hospital, children, Women's Children Hospital. And then I was also involved in Global Styles, which was run by me and uh, fellow students. We raised money and created different projects such as 
building little gift boxes to send to children, as well as creating pillowcases with funky designs on. This was all in the aims to help children with cleft palates. And I think what service really taught me is in Singapore and around the world, there's obviously communities of privilege, but there's also those who are less fortunate and have personal struggles. By able to helping those communities, it creates such a central self-awareness of the people that you're involved with, but also how you can give back to other communities. And whilst volunteering, you have the ability to build your own confidence, your confidence in helping others, communicating with others, and also recognizing the ways in which you enjoy helping others. So obviously extracurricular activities are very um, desirable for universities and jobs, but it's also about growing your own skills and transferring them to future opportunities. So some of the university applications or ask for personal statements of your activities involved with what have you done, what makes you a different and more unique individual from the next student. And so um, extracurricular activities can help you with this as research by Lambert et al. in 1992 suggested that students that participate in outside activities may increase um, a sense of community and build self-confidence. This is also supported by future research, which extracurricular activities have seen to increase grades. So you're actually building not only your outside brain from the classroom, but also your internal, transferring the skills that you have learned, such as leadership and clarity into the classroom. Mm. Lastly, I'd like to talk about um, mental health. As a psychology student, I understand the importance of self-care, emotional care, and understanding what you need to do to rest up and put your best foot forward. I understand that secondary school is stressful. There's so many exams, pressures to succeed. We have to start thinking about future careers. And that's why it's really important that we invest in act extra, extra activities outside the classroom. A study found that adolescents who participated in extra activities demonstrated high levels of satisfaction in life and had increased levels of optimism and decreased levels of anxiety and depression. If the activities we do help us build our mental health care, it will create a more stable and more care for mental health awareness that we can put forward during tough situations such as writing exams. An extracurricular activity doesn't have to be an activity that is only involved with others or an organization like a school club. It can purely be listening to music, going on a walk or watching a movie. These activities are also hobbies and pursuits that can help us build and experience new activities that can ultimately shape who we are. We should invest in ourselves and our skill sets, building a strong foundation for our future, which prioritizes activities that benefit our mental health and our future careers. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna, for sharing your um, what do you call a balanced life? You um, you mentioned also it's very important to have a balanced life, and you suggested uh, creativity, activity, and service. So um, you lastly you mentioned that self care is very important in personal growth. Once again, thank you, Jenna. Our second panel speaker is a former Rotaractor. Come secretary in the Rotector Club of Swinburne University, Sarawak, Malaysia. Ms. Hema Priya completed her bachelor's degree in business accounting and finance and now works at the, as an executive accounts and sales at Desert Fox Logistics. She likes organizing events and projects which benefit children. <laughs> Let's listen to her sharing of her club's books of hope 2.0 project. Over to you, Ms. Hemapriya. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So um, I a little bit introductions about myself again. I am Shema. 
and currently I'm working as an executive account and sales manager at the Cox. And as you can see that um, I'm still, I'm just 23 and my position is relatively com high compared to some of my friends. But would you see how far I've come till today? Why is, why is there like huge gap? I, I must say that I must thank the project that has been always close to my heart, Books of Hope. I'm sure some of you must have heard about the project, so allow me to share some of my experience and so how I executed the project. We donated almost 2,500 English books and 932 stationary items to two schools in Kuching that are very that are quite distant and very in rural. And so engaged the school with book students with various interactive activities to promote English learning among them. The Books of Hope 2.0 was a collaboration project with Interact Club of Bukit Gomba Eagles, Rotary Club of Sun. Uh, Sunway University, Rotary Club of Singapore, and the libraries of Swinburne, Sarawak, and also Melbourne. I have to admit that it was a very challenging event for a 19-year-old girl and with no experience to organize. Everything was challenging but equally fun and was an amazing learning process. Starting off with gathering all my BODs from meetings, preparing meeting agendas, completing tasks assigned to me, along with chasing my other board members to complete their tasks well, you wouldn't believe me if I said that I did not a single day, I failed to contact my advisor for advice, followed with the call prep for the event itself, sorting out all the books and stationery physically and packing them for both schools. It took us a few days to completely sort out, the, sort out them, followed with the planning for the entire itinerary for the entire event and including test run for the interactive activities with our fellow interactors from Bukit Gomba. It all sounds good and perfect planning, right? But reality isn't just like that. What a club or organization is all about, a group of people from various backgrounds, from various different personality and characters working together. Of course, there'll be a lot of obstacles in every aspect that you could think of. There were times where my fellow mates delayed or did not complete the task assigned to them, which I ended up completing because my goal is to ensure that project was successful. At that point, I realized how important it is to be proactive and manage time well in organizing in an organization. Current guess. Back then, the reason why I took part in activities was to, um, sorry, uh, okay. can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, yes. Continue, please. Hello. We cannot hear. We cannot hear you now. Hello. If there is something wrong with your your Wi-Fi, uh, you you may switch off your video and uh, just switch on your audio. Yes, yeah, switch off video, and you can you should be able to continue. Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. We can hear you yes. now. So sorry, I'm so sorry. Carry on, carry on. Okay. Um, at the point I realized how important is it for me to be proactive and manage my time well in an organization which currently helping me a lot in my career. There were many times I took initiative to get things done when it was not my responsibility to do it. I broke down at many stages as well as because I was not competent enough to complete my task as what you call that perfect, being perfect. I still remember I spent an entire day deciding on a restaurant and a menu to have, a, to have our welcoming dinner during our first session of the Hanover Books. Guess what next? 
guess what? The next day, I ended up at my advisor office asking for help to, to actually plan out the entire welcoming dinner. That's how incompetent I was. But that did not stop me. Currently, but not currently, but I'm working on a focus. I'm working on a forecasting cost budget on a business proposal in my business. Do you see how far I've come mm -hmm. from just organizing mm -hmm. a simple mm -hmm. dinner to a, 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 a business that worth a 10K, a 100K business? Currently, the Rotary Club of Swimmers have just donated. Uh, to, I've just donated 1,500 books to three primary schools uh, one hour away from coaching for Books of Hope 3.0. And now they're working on preparing a free training for the teachers in charge of the libraries at each school that they have donated. How hard is it do you think to achieve your goals or to be successful? I tell you, it's all about having the right mindset and goals. It's very simple. Whether you want to be successful or not, that's all you have to think. Yes, some points that I think it's crucial for young adults to be aware of young career development that which have actually helped me. Being resilient and flexible is the most important key that we all should adhere. Of course, during my journey of being a secretary at Rotary Club of Simban Sarawak, multiple times I wanted to give up and let it go. Things were very tough for me and it wasn't the only club I was involved and I had a couple of other clubs and responsibility at the same time. But then I think back then, the reason why I joined the club and took part in the activities, then get back to my responsibilities and continue. I believe nothing comes easy, especially success. Then of course, passion and interest. Be it a club or business organization, you don't have a passion and interest you may never achieve the goal you have set for. The passion will keep you motivated during the tough time. The interest will push you further learning and eventually success. Being flexible is very important, whether in a club, an NGO, or your business, or even at a career. They all have one thing in common, which is people. People from different backgrounds, status, character, personalities, or even habits. In that case, when there's a hardworking people, they will always be the opposite of them. You may be a fast learner and your fellow mates or colleagues may be the opposite. So what do you do? What could you do? You may be an introvert and your colleagues totally opposite of you. So the quick and easy solution is adapt quickly and be proactive. If you're quick and <clears throat> if, likewise, if you're slow and you don't know something, also be proactive. I wouldn't be ashamed to tell when I first joined the company, I did not know how to prepare closing accounts for my boss company. And I am like, and to say I'm an accounting graduate. Surprise, right? I'm telling you, I wasn't embarrassed. Um, it's okay if you don't know. Go to your supervisor to ask them to teach you. It's all part of learning process. Many of us don't do. Don't know, don't do. We all have this kind of habit. And the last one is, Time. Time is your biggest enemy when you're working hard to be successful. You don't want to be at the same. You may think that you don't want to be at the same time, same place where you were last year. <clears throat> this is the best time to practice time management when you're still being a student or you're trying to develop your career. Because once the time passes, you will never get the same time again. With that, I end my speech. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Himapriya. Um, Ms. Himapriya has shared with us uh, what the Swinburne uh, clubs has done uh, regarding their Book of Hopes 2.0 and 3.0. She has also shared with us four important takeaways in her uh, career development, uh, which are flexibility and resilience, passion and um, interest, proactiveness, and of course, time management. Thank you, Ms. Hima Priya. Our next speaker is Ms. Tan Lee Fei, who is an interactor from Batu Pahat, Johor, Malaysia. She is now studying in Form 4. Over to you, Ms. Tan. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dato Tasya. 
Mm. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Intractor Lee from Intractor of SMK Diogen. Today, I will discuss about education and career development. Okay, so what is education and career development? Career development education is consists of well-designed strategies for teaching and learning that about enable a student to prepare for a successful in future in an economically global career. Okay, next is why career development education is important. First, I think grows your social network. This topic, we are not talking about adding no more friends on Facebook. In our classroom setting, you have the opportunity to interact and meet your meet with fellow students who may come from a variety of professional backgrounds. In begins export to a broader professional network through continuing your education, you can get to know people who may be in similar situation as you or have been in the spot you're in and have continued to advance their career. Your network ground through earning a agree can be a well in, of insight and information as you advance your own career. Second is the boost your confidence for success. When you earn a degree, you compose a big step. You gain knowledge, skill, and experience to help your board in your career and in life in general. On the top of that, by gaining additional skill in communication and problem solving and achieving your goals. You can also increase your confidence and studies have shown that graded confidence leads to graded career advancement. Okay. The next is advantage of career development. For example, reduce cost career development leads to higher employer retention, which cut down on the cost of constantly hiring new people. The second is fill skills grab. Giving employers access to training helps address existing or expected uh, skill grab. Third is prepare for the future. A skilled workforce is a key part of successful succession planning. Fourth is create a strong company culture. When a company actively shows it cares about employers, it leads a more motivated, engaged, and invested workforce. Okay, the next is so we can creating a career development plan. First is plan your meeting. Plan up the general discussion topic and try to gain feedback. Then is have a conversation. Get to know your employers, interest, patients, career goal. After that is create the plans. Include employers, career goals, timelines, step and more. Next is point them toward resources. Suggest revealment resources for yeah, employers. Last is follow up. Remind invested and keep employers accountable. Okay. The last is talking about function of education. First is con cultural transmissions, tools, ideas, knowledge, norms, values, attitudes, and beliefs. The Second is anticipatory socialization, teaching knowledge and skills necessary for successful fulfillment, future roles and statistics. The third is integrations, 
bringing together people from diverse social backgrounds so that share common social experience, experience and develop it co commonly helps norm attitudes and belief. The last is innovations, creating new knowledge and finding new ways to accepting knowledge. My similar is main goals of career education is improving outcomes and achievement are central to the overall goals of, of career education. The structure instills students with the knowledge and skill they need to open a meaningful career. Career education makes rewarding work possible regardless of the student's interest Aptness of our abilities. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Lifei, for sharing uh, your um, what do you call that um, suggestions on improving education and career development. You also uh, suggested that you know uh, everyone should grow their social network and even boost confidence for success. Um, there are certain advantages in your career development, and um, you have also highlighted the importance and the functions of education. Once again, thank you, Li Fei. Our fourth and final sp panel speaker on the education topic is also an interactor from Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Papar Sabah, Malaysia. She is Miss Jasmine Binti Jumat. Over to you, Miss Jasmine. Thank you, Dr. Harja Tarsia. Now, my talk are supposed to be in recording, but there's a technical technical difficulties. But it's okay. We have Plan B. Okay, thanks. So I don't have any um, slides to share with, but I do have a story to share with you guys. So bear with me. Before we get started, have you guys ever heard the story about Raden Anjan Kartini, or also known as Raden Ayu Kartini, the educator? She was one of the national heroines in Indonesia who aimed to fight for women's rights. She insists that women have the right to learn and study. Raden Anjum Kartini also opened the first Indonesian primary school for girls that did not discriminate. Raden Anjum Kartini once said, what a big difference it will make for the community if the young women were well educated and for the needs of the women herself. We hope with a great hope that lesson and education will be provided because this will bring them happiness. What if the community at that time will never gonna accept that women can also lead the world one day? Or what if they think women and girls don't want or need an education? Where did all the girls gonna be in this day? Maybe we already had a husband, a child get abused, being widow at the young age. Until now, I am still mesmerized by her struggle to maintain the status of women in education. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jasmine Juman. I am 17 years old. I am from Papar Sabah. And currently I am still studying in high school for my senior year. And I will take a big exam for this year, which is Malaysian Certificate, Malaysian Certificate of Education, SPM. My strengths are my attitude that I like to take challenges and my mindset that always think I can do it. This way of thinking that both success and failure in a balanced manner. Fun facts about me is I ran my own business. It's called Sweet Tricks by Jasmine J, founded in the mean of the MCO solely because of my obsession with desserts and sweet that can release the tension from everything with their sweetness. Sweet Treats by Jasmine J are a home-based company that symbolize our family recipe. Well, that's me. And today, 
I will be talking about girls empowerment in the aspect of education. Ladies and gentlemen, did you know Malaysian women and girls have continued to play an increasingly important role in the national development of the country, including greater participation in economy. These improvements were made possible by the increasing number of females having access to education. Educations provide better work opportunities and thus increase the level of income of an individual. Therefore, education is perceived to be an important factor in human capital formation. This research was carried out in a local district, Papar, in the state of Sabah. Papar is an agriculture town located 38.5 kilometers from the state capital, Kota Kinabalu. It is found that 78% of total female in Papar perceive that education is very important. A total of 47.1% strongly agree that education can influence future income. Essentially, a total of 78.8% agreed that higher level of education leads a higher level of income. From my point of view, education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. On the, head, on the other hand also, in Sabah, the most likely in remote areas, female students quit school at the early age. The reason of it is that their parents think that education is not priority for their daughter and they prefer their daughter to get married young. As a result, there are many girls younger than me who already have a kid and become widow because at the end, their husband tends to leave and divorce them. Now, let's talk about the education. There is this one statement that said, women don't have to go to school or even university to get their degree or master or even PhD because it's the man who gonna lead the family. There is also a statement that said, women do not need to have an amazing career because the man will be the breadwinner of the family. Based on Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaimed by United Nations 1948, education is human right, not a privilege. Everybody, whoever they are, all gender deserve to get education. Unfortunately, the reality is a little bit different. All right, how about the social life that we as a girl deal with at school? When the teacher start to start to ask us what we wanted to be when we grew up, our answers were like astronaut, doctor, or in my case, a princess. When we were 10, they asked again, and we answered an artist, a dancer, a chef. But now that we've grown up, they want a serious answer. And I answered, I want to change the world. I want to be an economist who successfully balance the national economy by controlling the inflation and deflation or reducing unemployment rate. And people are start laughing at me because I'm a girl. There's no such a thing I can change the world. Seriously, girls, they have mind and they have souls as well as just heart. They've got ambition and they've got talent as well as just beauty. And I am so sick of people saying that love is just all the girls fit for. My tears are start fall. I say, whoa, this can't hang in there. This can't be happening. What should I do now? My dreams are win. It makes me scared to dream big again. But uh -uh, this can't be happen. There is no one can stop me from what I want. Oh yes, people do even call me bossy, but excuse me, who are you? I have a dream to achieve. And I started think more about my future. You know, if you don't dream it, you don't see it and it doesn't gonna happen. 
dream. It always gonna start with a dream. Yeah, that's how girls do take their power back. We may just need a whole day of crying, but the next day we come back stronger. Basically, education can help women to lead independent life of dignity. Also, it can help getting out of poverty and it can help encourage them to make their own decision. Anyways, here's what you can do to empower girls at school by starting to support them with to have the confidence to take a leadership. For example, by offering them the roles instead of asking for volunteers, remember to treat us equally. We also can do what men does. Remember, break the vias, guys. This may be a start for of a new journey for them as may they feel more trusted if we're offered the role. I also think that society should stop critic and start giving advice or ways that can help those who have just started their journey in leadership. Stop judging and encourage more by giving motivational words and act of support. Girls' leadership in school is important because it can help us build confidence and practice teamwork. For me personally, it has helped me to learn strategize, make decisions, solve problems, manage people's behaviors, be patient, and improve my communication skills. I believe the first and foremost action that should be taken to further support girls in taking leadership in school is to stop the stigma surrounding a girl's ability to lead. In fact, I also believe that all of us should play a role when it comes to climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end. I sincerely honor and appreciate that I've had this chance to present these issues to each and every one of you today. I'd like to thank you for your precious time and your attention today. Thank you and have a great day. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Jasmine. Um, even though she has extended more than almost two minutes, I allowed it because it was a very interesting sharing uh, from Jasmine. Um, she has even shared uh, some historical background from uh, from Radin, Radin Ayanjin Kartini in Indonesia about those girls' education. She even also shared a survey um, involving uh, some folks in, uh, in Papar, Sabah, Malaysia, uh, which literally means that education is the most important weapon to improve one's life. Jasmine is very, very passionate in empowering girls. So kudos to Jasmine. Thank you again, Jasmine. I have gone through uh, our, our first session, uh, our first topic that is on education and career development. And I am still looking at the chat box, uh, looking for questions um, and comments. But um, so far, I couldn't find any yet. And we have five minutes to look into. Oh. Okay, um, there is one right now. Um, this is just written, just written from Alexandria Liang, all right? And she was asking, um, Iman, please uh, read the chat box at the same time. How were you able to maintain a close relationship with your parents while studying in Japan? Did the time difference between Morocco and Japan affect your relationship with your parents? So th this is more on uh, some kind of personal um, between you and your parents, uh, Iman. Uh, would you like to answer that? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. And great question, Alexandria. Um, yes, the time difference was uh, really hard. Uh, my parents and uh, my siblings and I needed to learn when to call each other because my mom, when she wanted to call me, it was 2 a.m. in Japan uh, when it's afternoon for her. So uh, we, we, we set um, agreements that Every Sunday, I will call her at some point at, at uh, my time, which is, for example, late afternoon for me, early morning for her, because the time difference with, was eight, uh, eight hours. And that uh, for the last 22 years, I call my parents every Sunday, uh, 7, 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. Uh, that helps keep the relationship alive. And if I am not available or if they are not available, we tell each other that um, let's we cannot do this Sunday, I'm traveling or they are traveling. But by default, uh, I kept uh, regular communication, especially with my mom. Uh, I'm her eldest and her, her only daughter. She has three sons. So it was very uh, important for me to keep that relationship with my mother for the last 20 years. And now I'm... 40, I have two kids, and if I don't call her on Sunday, she calls me. Uh, so it's it's very important to keep uh, this communication. But again, one thing, Alexandria, we take parents for granted, we take connections for granted, and when we do that, we lose track. Please be intentional, intentional of uh, keeping the communication with your loved ones, because if you don't, things go lost in translation. Um, so that's how we, uh, even if it was time difference, we agreed on the time uh, that's suitable for both of us, and we agreed on the cadence. Uh, so, uh, so that's how I am. I'm, I'm really still very close to my mother. Very true, Rotary and Iman. We still need to keep our relationship, especially with our loved ones. Uh, either now it's so easy with all these uh, gadgets that you know you can Skype, you can even Zoom with your family and with others at the same time. All right, uh, is there any other questions? I am um, given. Okay, there's a question also from Alexandria Liang. Jenna, okay, this is for Jenna. I was also an, I, an IB student. Oh, is that it? So what was the transition from an IB student to a uh, university student like? Again, this is kind of personal. <laughs> um, Jenna, uh, would you like to answer this? Thank you for your question, Alexandria. I found the transition quite challenging. So it was during 2020, during the pandemic. So I went from like full-time school to online university in a foreign country where I didn't know anyone. So that was really different. but. I think what Iman said about just creating communities and a support system, just building those friendships with your classmates. So it's an easier day to get through, an easier class to get through, and just, you know, building friendships have really helped me during the transition, as well as just keeping up to date on work. It can be overwhelming at times, but we're all capable of doing great things when we put our mind to it. So hope that helps. Thank you, Jenna. Well, uh, we have only one minute left from our five minutes uh, question and answer session. Um, I don't have any other questions here, but I was, uh, my goodness, there's another one here. Okay, um, last last questions. Huh? Rotarian Iman, is it, this is from Akansk, Akansk Shah, Sharma, right? Um, is it possible for women to balance their personal and professional lives without having to step down in one aspect to advance in the other? For example, with your first son being born, you step down from your leadership role. Is it always necessary for women to sacrifice their professional life to start a family? Rotran Iman, would you like to have a quick answer to this? <laughs> I don't think it, it's, uh, it, it would be quick, but I'll do my best. Um, it, it's possible, it's possible, uh, Akansha, to, 
to balance between your uh, personal life and your professional life. And uh, for example, my second son in 2015, uh, I went to get promoted and lead more, uh, even if I have two under two, uh, which was really difficult. Again, going back to the support system, uh, ensuring that you have a support system. In my first child, just to give a little bit of background, because for the 20 minutes I didn't share uh, the reasons why I stepped down. I stepped down not because uh, I, I didn't have a support system, but I stepped down because my boss had a, an unconscious bias against women coming back to work. So I had a lot of uh, power abuse after I came back from uh, from my first son, uh, Bert. Uh, he told me that I have post-mortem depression. Uh, he was challenging and undermining every decision I made in my leadership position as if my brain fried when I gave birth, which is not the case. So I had to uh, make decision on my well-being and leave that toxic environment and that toxic, uh, uh, toxic boss. But uh, reality, I was not... Um, I didn't step back uh, from day one. Uh, I went back to work, but sometimes bosses and leadership think that as soon as a woman gives birth, then she, she loses her brain and intelligence. Uh, so that was something that, um, that impacted my first uh, child. My second child, I have a more supportive boss and therefore uh, this was very good. So uh, build your support system, just plan, a plan, delegate, plan, delegate, schedule, and then you will be able to have it. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Iman, for sharing your, your experience with us. While well, every one of us ladies had gone through this kind of um, kind of bias or even discrimination in our work life. Um, okay, we have already completed our our first uh, topic and there was a cue from uh, our organizing chairperson that there will be some photograph taking so can okay, all of us please switch on your videos don't forget there will be e-certificates um, issued <laughs> go ahead pp polita yes jacqueline is taking over jack okay are we all ready Okay, uh, right. PDG is not on. Okay. Okay, Leave please uh, turn on your video, all of you. We want to see uh, you in the conference. See you in the conference. Make sure your light is not making your face too dark. Make sure you're not yeah. facing, uh, you know, your back is not at the light. <laughs> yeah. if, you're, if your face is dark on screen, please uh, try to shift your screen a little bit so that you can see your face. It yeah. <laughs> will be three pages or three shots. Okay. Yes. Okay, ready? Okay, ready? One, two, three, smile. Okay, then another page. Ready? One, two, three, smile. Okay, one more time. Ready? One, two, three, smile. Okay, and another one. Okay, ready? One, two, three, smile. Okay, I only have two pages. Oh, okay. Okay, All good. Right. All done. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh -huh. So, shall I proceed with yes, our please. second topic? Okay. Our second topic uh -huh. is on uh -huh. health uh -huh. and hygiene. There will be one main speaker and there will be five panel speakers. Okay. Um, I just saw that that to uh -huh. Dr. Rosnan uh -huh. our, our main speaker, is already in the Zoom. All right. So Dr. Dr. Rosnani Mudin is the Sabah State's Department of Health Director. She is also a consultant in public health position. She had held several senior positions in the Ministry of Health, including Deputy Director of Disease Control Division, Head of Vector Born Disease Sector. She earned her doctorate in medicine, surgery, and obstetrics in 1992 from the University of Ghent, Belgium, and obtained her master's degree in public health in 2003, and another master's degree in public health of epidemiology, do I pronounce it correctly, from the University of Malaya in 20, 2007. 
Let's welcome yang berbahagia Datuk Dr. Rosnani to share her experience and advice on health and hygiene in respect to the girls' empowerment. Over to you, Datuk Dr. Rosnani. Yeah, thank you, uh, Datuk Tarsia. Uh, very good afternoon. Assalamualaikum, Datuk, uh, Tuan Tuan, uh, Miss, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me to share these um, uh, topics. Um, I was given this topic on the empowering girls, I think women and girls in, in health and hygiene. Uh, so maybe um, I will share my PowerPoint now. So um, can you all see my, my, my slides? Can you yes, enlarge? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Is it okay? okay? Can see? Right, it's okay. Yes. Can hear well? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So allow me to start here, yeah, Datuk. Go ahead. All right. Um, um, okay. Um, I start with um, um, looking, we are looking at the Malaysia uh, females populations. Actually, in the world, we have like about 3.9 billion uh, uh, people uh, or women um, that actually representing about 49.58% of the world populations. Whereas in Malaysia, we have like 15.5 million women and representing about 52% of our population. So actually here, the message here is women and girls are very important in our uh, population. So we half of the populations are actually consists of women and girls. So, um, and, and for before we go to the, the serious topic on empowering women and girls in the health and hygiene, um, I would like to attract your attention on um, how WHO actually um, focus on the women's empowerment in, in the public health uh, imperative. So this is one of the topic that they have discussed in 19, uh, 2021. So they know that uh, empowerment, the women's and girls are very important in our daily life. So uh, apart from that, actually, uh, why they have brought uh, this issue, uh, women's and girls empowerment is important because there are um, a few issues happening around for women and girls, which uh, example the gender inequity, which cause, um, cause uh, effect. Uh, of hunger and poverty in many of the country. And um, uh, uh, based on the WHO uh, data that there are 60% of chronically hunger people are women and girls. So, uh, and also women make up 43% of the agricultural labor force in our, in the developing country, that's include Malaysia. So women also contribute two thirds of the world's 70, 796 million illiterate people. So there's a lot issue of, about women and girls all in, in, the, in the world. So um, um, data from 68 countries indicate that women's uh, education is a key factor in determining a child's survival. So it is also very important uh, topics that uh, has been discussed in the World Health uh, Organizations. And there are research uh, indicates that when more income uh, uh, put into the hands of women, uh, child nutrition, health and education improve. So this is the what we call the power of women in the in the world and also in our daily living. So, um, sorry, I can't move my slides. Sorry. Um, sorry, I am having problem moving my slides. Uh, Thank you. Take team, can you take over? Can you help me? Uh, maybe I just stop share first. Yeah. Sure, sure. We will, we will try to retrieve your slides now. Yeah. Can you control from there? Yes, yes they uh, can. Wait a moment. No, no worries. I think the screen is. 
That's why we need a copy of that. Yeah, sorry. Sorry for the technical glitch. Okay, we have your slides, Datu. Yeah, uh, I think we can go to slides number three now. Right. Uh, I can, uh, okay, I can go to slide number four. Okay, so um, the other facts that's about women is that women access to decision making and leadership is still limited. This is also documented in WHO in the United Nations Women's um, uh, website. And educated women are more likely to have greater decision making power within their household. This is where uh, in, in one of the articles written in the UN Women Facts and Figures. Like this. Um, before we go to the um, about the empowerment uh, topic, so just just have a look. What is the definition of empowerment? Um, there's a lot of definition of empowerment, but I think I take the the simplest definitions, which um, empowerment is a situation during which people or women or girls can or, or organizations and communities acquire the needed to control over the issues that affect them. So it means that this uh, empowerment means that they have uh, a, a uh, ability to, to uh, identify and to choose and also to, to uh, improve the situations. So empowerment in health, um, examples that I can give here is, um, this is uh, all from uh, the studies and also from the um, um, uh, websites, the health websites, um, and also from the um, uh, world population website, that uh, empowerment in health um, examples that they give are improving, for example, when they have uh, the, the capability of improving the health, the healthcare and the well-being of their, uh, well, of their well-being or for the women's or the girls um, that um, living with them, uh, identifies area of need and evaluating solution uh, to potential and actual health problems of the women and girls. And they can also identify the social and psychological environmental uh, effects of health so that they can improve. Um, um, I have not finished the slide before, please. Go back to the, somebody move the slide. All right, thank you. Uh, and also, um, uh, and ensuring a good environment in early childhood, and also they can uh, make a decisions for their own health. Next slide, please. And why uh, empowerment of girls and women in health is important. Uh, this is also has been stated in the WHO uh, documentations that um, the, where WHO commits, um, uh, commits uh, focusing on ending the gender bias violence and advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights and supporting health workers as well as feminist movements and leaderships. Uh, this commitment uh, is to shape the progress and uh, uh, transformative blueprint uh, for advancing gender equality, equity, and also health equity, human rights, and the empowerment of women and girls globally. And um, women and girls face an acceptable level of discriminations and abuse all over in, in many countries. So this actually prevents them from taking part in the society and also making them uh, have difficulty in uh, making decisions for even for their own health. And the gender bias that happened actually around us and in many other countries uh, still um, embedded in the cultures 
and also in the economies, politics, and also in the social institution around the world. Next slide, please. And there were a study done um, by um, in Iran um, where um, they, they found that when they empower the women through health information seeking, I mean, they, through health information education, and this actually um, um, improve improve the uh, in uh, this actually improve the management of uh, the health management and where these women have a better coping for stress and they can manage their stress and they also control the situation well and this also give an uh, uh, improve uh, the effective interaction between the health profession and and between the women's and the girls and and apart from that the this can this also uh, help in the individual development and they also have a self protection with life modification prevention behaviors promoting and self care promoting so uh, uh, this study shows that the empowerment of women uh, through uh, uh, health information um, um, delivering to the uh, deliver to the women and the girls has actually increased their participation in the healthcare and their involvement in and sense of responsibility in prevention and protecting and promotion of health of themselves and also not only for themselves but also for, to their family society and uh, people around them Next slide, please. So um, I, I prepared this slide because uh, when I read a lot of uh, articles about empowerment, I think there are two aspects that is important when you when we when we want to empower uh, women or girls. Uh, one is the education, and two is the employment status. So this actually, um, I will. Uh, elaborate more later, this, this two aspects actually give the confidence to the women, uh, especially when they want, when we empower themselves. So, uh, so by looking, uh, before we go into details on the empowerment, if we look here that in, in the, in, this is the world, um, uh, educational educational attainment uh, worldwide, where um, about 88% of the female all over the world actually are uh, they receive a primary education level and um, about 66 percent of them receive uh, about secondary uh, education level and 41 percent of them are uh, managed to go to the higher level for example in the university whereas in our country in malaysia if you see on the on the top on the top row, um, about only six, five to six percent of our female populations are um, ha have no formal educations. Most probably, maybe they are illiterate. Okay, only five to six percent. And then next slide, please. Next slide. And then uh, this data actually supports the previous uh, slides where in Malaysia, about 99 to 95% of our women are, uh, uh, they, they are, they are they, this is the literacy, literacy rate. Our literacy rate in Malaysia are between 95 to 99%. So um, we can say that most of the women in Malaysia, they can write, they can read, and they also, some of them are educated. Next slide. So um, I've gone through a few studies and articles. Then, um, then I found out that in this, most of this article and, and studies uh, shows that factors that contributing to women's and girls' empowerment are um, uh, actually related to education and also the skill development and also employment and decision making and domestic work sharing and also family support. And of course, economy security and social protection is uh, also uh, 
factors that contribute to the women and girls empowerment so uh, if we empower women and girls they must be able to sustain this uh, empowerment otherwise they will not be able to um, um, benefit from the empowerment that is given to them so apart from that uh, other factors that contribute to uh, sustaining of the empowerment of women and girls are actually um, 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 uh, the gender equity and equality, uh, gender equality and equity. So this is important in when we want to empower our women and girls uh, in in our country or uh, around us. And the government, the government policy and commitment on gender policy and strategy and roadmap is also important to support the uh, women and girls empowerment and support from non-governmental organization and other agency for women and girls empowerment programs and activities such as uh, Rotary International organizations uh, might help uh, the women and the girls to sustain their um, uh, to sustain this empowerment. Next slide, please. So, um, in conclusion, that empowerment of women and girls in health will directly determine their family's health status. So it is very important that we empower uh, the women and the girls in health so that they can also um, um, determine this, this factor is actually also uh, determine the, the family health status. Education play an important role in empowering women and girls and women should have access to higher education and career opportunities in improving their health status. And women uh, having rights uh, are more confident and they have better standards of living and decision-making. And women should have access to all resources and credit and adequate support from family, domestic working sharing should be there uh, to support the empowerment of women and girls. Of course, government policy and gender equality and equity is essential for the sustainability of women and girls' empowerment. And women's and girls' empowerment must be the agenda of the government and private agency so that we can carry, um, um, so, that, so that we can improve the, the women's and the girls' um, 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 in terms of their livings, in terms of their daily life, and uh, in and helping them in doing a good decisions for their for themselves. I think uh, that too. I end my presentation. Can uh, the last slides? Uh, I like this last slides. So when we empower women and girls, of course, there you have you can design your own life, and then of course write your own stories. Thank you very much, Datu. I like that last slide, Datu. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Datu, Dr. Rosnani Mudin. Uh, yes, you have shared some statistics. There are now 3.9 billion women, you know, uh, which is comprised, uh, which is uh, make up about 49.8% of the world population. Almost 50% are women in the world. And in Malaysia, there are 15.5 million women, which is uh, about 52% of Malaysian uh, population. That's a lot, right? Yeah. So we should have at least an equal share um, because that was, um, is a very strong supporter in the diversity, equality, and uh, inclusivity uh, agenda among women. Um, that also has shared some other uh, figures and uh, facts and figures about women and girls. Um, but I would like just to summarize that Datu uh, mentioned about women's education and better income are the key important factors in improving the lives of the women uh, or girls, which will lead to a healthier life among the women and girls. Once again, thank you so much, Datu, Dr. Rosnani, for sharing with us some of your um, slides in uh, regarding the uh, health and hygiene uh, to empower girls. Thank you so much.
All right. Thank you. Now comes to um. Let me go through. I I I ran out of my my battery, so a lot of things are not there yet. Okay. Um. Let me go again. I'm trying to find out what happened to my my program. It's not there. Can I take over? Somehow. That's okay. Yeah, That's okay. I know. Can I take over? Uh, the, yeah, the, it is. The next one is uh, Rotaractor Grace Tang, who is uh, from the Rotaract Club of Singapore. So can I uh, can I introduce her? Um, yes, you can because uh, somehow I lost my okay my, just, my topic. Uh, okay, yes, go ahead. Maybe we, yeah, I just uh, introduce her very briefly. Thank you, She's thank you. The Rotaract Club of Singapore as vice president and international service director. She's twenty years old and currently in her first year in the Singapore Institute of uh, Technology, taking up diagnostic radiography course. She's very passionate about women and children's health. Healthcare in general, also. She will speak about the project Pinay, which the Rotary Club just completed in the Philippines. And this was actually featured by PRID Sawalak just a while ago. Over to you, Grace. Thank you so much, Pipi Paleto. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity for me to share with you about the project Pinay. Before we begin, I would like to send regards from my co director, Chloe Chia, who is unable to make it today. So this is how Project Pini started. With no sex education in the Philippines, the high teenage pregnancy rate and the fact that abortion is illegal in the Philippines. This led to many girls having to drop out of school to look after their children and leave as a mother for the rest of their lives. So in order to empower them, we came up with a plan, which is to educate them about sex, puberty, family planning, rights, and many, many more topics which can equip them for the future with the hope that this will improve their quality of life. At the same time, since Singapore has the privilege of sex education from the age of 10 to 16, it made us appreciate sex ed even more. So our first partner was the Rotary International District 3800, which centered around Metro Manila. They had access to the internet and understood English, and hence we conducted sex education online for them. For our second partner, it was the sister club of Rotary Singapore, Rotary Club of Rizal West. They partnered us to help the girls in a rural village, Pampanga, which has limited internet and electricity. The people also did not understand English and hence sex ed was conducted on site for them. So this was the program for RID 3800. It centered around the topic of sex education, which include menstruation, contraceptives, sexual abuse, mental health, and more. This was conducted over eight sessions for two groups, each session lasting one to two hours. This was the timeline for RCRW and it covered the same topics as RID 3800, except we tailored both programs to their respective needs. So the main highlight was pack making where the materials were sourced locally in Singapore and distributed by our Filipino partners. The pad making was very significant for our partners as most of them had never used or heard of a reusable pad before or even sewed before. The rationale behind the sanitary pad is to make it accessible to all who has financial constraints and it is more beneficial to the environment as compared to disposable ones. This is also in hopes that they will be able to recreate their pets with locally available resources and make a living out of it. And we also created a booklet for the participants to refer to during or after the event, which participants found helpful. So here are the images of the pet as well as the booklet that was printed out. And here are some images of the pictures for online event. Here are some for the on-site event. And both programs um, had 100 participants each. So that made um, the project benefit 200 people. So right now, I'll, I'll play a short video to sum up the event. First of all, I want to thank the Rotary Club of uh, Rizal West for helping us out in this very, very big project. And a lot of work you have been put in by you. Can you imagine three? Tatlong van kayo dumating at saka ilang oras ninyo pinagbaan. So before we 
before we begin the event, let me give you a I hope you guys enjoyed the video. So for the presentation, we recruited around 21 people for, uh, sorry, for the preparation, we recruited around 21 people from our team and ensured that everyone had a common goal and direction in carrying out the project. The team had smaller groups who were in charge of booklets, education materials, pet making, welfare, and so on. So for the online event, the participants found the booklet and pet making beneficial and even our partners and Rotarians who joined us found the event helpful. Some issues were network issues which were inevitable but overall the project carried out smoothly and completely. Lastly, during the closing ceremony, a male participant mentioned that this web webinar was very beneficial for him as he can use this knowledge to help four of his sisters and he understood his sisters better. So for our on-site project, the project, uh, the participants enjoyed the pet making and very and were very proactive in learning new things about sex education. So during the event, very inspiring President Joanne and President Cookie from Rotary Club of Rizal West translated the lesson for them. However, it was useful to have an interpreter who could relay the messages between both groups. Safety was also ensured in both events by reminding the participants to step out whenever uncomfortable. Lastly, I want to thank PB Palita and Rotary Singapore for giving us your full support during this event. So I've come to the end of my presentation. I thank you so much for your attention and for the opportunity being here. If you want to know more about Project Pini, you can scan the QR code below um, to follow us on Project Pini uh, on Instagram. And email us at projectpinny.regsg at gmail.com if you have any inquiries. Thank you. Thank you, Rotorector Grace. So Grace has shared Project Pinay. Um, these are uh, projects involving girls' involvement in the Philippines. Uh, basically, uh, it was on sex education and sewing of the reusable sanitary pads and even created a booklet for this. Thank you so much, uh, Grace. All right, now I'm back with my um, uh, uh, phone. The second panel speaker on health and hygiene is Rotaractor Andrea So. She is currently the treasurer in the Rotaract Club of Sinburn, Sarawak. So over to you, Rotaractor Andrea. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Indra from our trade club of Simon Sawa. So it's very nice to meet you all. I'll be talking about pure property and I will also cover a little bit on the project that our trade club of Simon Sawa have been working on recently. So without further ado, 
All right, so do you know that in 2018, the World Bank stated that an estimated 500 million women and girls all over the world lack adequate basic facilities for menstrual hygiene management. In other words, they are suffering from period poverty. So before we go deep into it, what is period poverty? Period poverty refers to a lack of access to menstrual products, sanitation facilities, and adequate education on menstruation topics. For many of us, our menstruation products are just everywhere as we need it. But that is not the case for many girls and women all around the world. About one in four women and girls between ages of 13 and 35 years old are finding it hard to manage their periods. And 47 of them are having trouble to access menstruation supply since pandemic. So priority, period priority is a thing that's happening. So from like what Rotary Grace has, our water director Grace was talking about this now, some girls in Philippines, they have not even seen a pet before, that let alone having access to it. So it is a thing and it needs our attention. What are the main causes of period priority? So period priority is mostly is mostly caused by a very simple and direct reason, low income. If you are only earning enough money to choose between filling your stomach and other necessities, then period products can just quickly slip down your list of priorities. Sometimes they will have to prioritize more important things first, like their daily necessities, food, before even able to consider their feminine needs. Another reason is, of course, people who are living in rural areas lack access to the products. Sometimes it's like really simple reasons due to the lack of stores that supply these needs because of the geographical location that they are in, or they might have to travel a long distance before having stores that carry sanitary products. So how does period poverty impact girls all around the world? Now that we know that, uh, we all know that like hygiene during menstruation period is very important. Ever since we start menstruation, we are being taught that we have to clean, keep ourselves clean during menstruation to prevent infection. So ideally, sanitary napkins should be changed every four hours. But for those who are facing period poverty, just having access to them are a luxury. What more at being able to change it frequently? We have even heard stories from some people that they have to reuse pads for much longer than it is considered safe from a sanitary standpoint, or even having to resort using coconut husks or other piecemeal items to manage their menstrual cycle. It might sound hideous and impossible to do it, but it is something that is happening. And this is really unhygienic. And, but because they are suffering from period poverty, they have to endure it. But poor menstrual hygiene can lead to many issues with the most obvious one being like fungal or bacterial infections of the reproductive tract and urinary tract. There's also like yeast infection that is very prone to happen during menstruation. And period poverty also cause like mental and emotional challenges because there's like this stigma surrounding periods that prevents individuals from talking about it. So it can make people feel like shameful or embarrassed for menstruating. And they are like unlikely to seek for help due to the taboo surrounding the topic. People who are experiencing period poverty are unable to purchase menstrual products they need. So in many cases, they cannot participate in daily life activities like just going to work or going to school. So this is a thing that needs our attention. And we know that in the current pandemic situation, there are like a lot of attention given to rural or low-income groups regarding the concerns on food or daily necessities. There are like all there are like campaigns all over Malaysia that donates food and daily needs to those who need it. However, this cannot be uh, said the same for hygienic needs, especially with regards to period priority. There are very few projects that actually cover this need. So the Rotary Club of Swimming Sawa, in collaboration with Rotary Club of Kuching Central, we saw this as an opportunity for us to provide help for, to those who need it. And so we launched the period, uh, Ending Period Priority Project. It is a simple donation project, really, but it is something that we believe will have direct impact on those who are suffering from period poverty. So this project ran from November 2021 to February 2022. It is a donation of sanitary products to young women from the B40 community in secondary institution. We partnered with Sawa Women for Women's Society, SWWS, who act as an intermediary for purchase of sanitary products at a discounted price. And we asked from their advice and discussed with them on the project. We also worked with RC Kuching Central to successfully apply for the district 3310 COVID-19 grant. 
our objective for this project is really simple. We, we just want to elevate the issue of property among rural students. We want them to have adequate access to menstrual products. And above and beyond contributing to the needs of young women for the B40 community in secondary education institution, we are also hoping that the campaign will be able to amplify the discussion around period priority that will further inspire efforts to help with the issue in Malaysia. Basically, we are hoping that by doing this project, we can increase the awareness of the people on the importance of female hygiene and let them know that the, ch the challenges that the girls are facing due to their circumstances. We really hope that through such effort, we can help to improve sanitary standards among rural communities and also increase the awareness of Rotary and Rotary Club in the community. The, benef the beneficiary of this product was said to be the female students in the B40 categories from the Padawan area, an area that had already been afflicted by period priority prior to the pandemic. So with help and support from the District 321 COVID-19 grant, we donated two months worth of sanitary pads to 432 female students in, in, uh, from SNK Tarat coming from low-income families. It might not sound a lot, but we hope that it can help to lighten the, their burden as the pandemic situation gradually improved. So here are some of the pictures that we took during the delivery of the sanitary pads to the school. The good news is that with the success of the first project, we are granted more funds to do a part two of the project. And this time, this is, it will be double of the budget used for a project, which means that we will be able to cover a larger area and more students. We are still in the planning stage for the following project, but we are hoping to get them delivered by maybe early or mid-May. So as a recap, I talked about, talk about the period priority and the impact on it on girls and women all around the world. And hence, it's important that efforts are done to help with peer property. And I also talk about the project that Rotary Cup of Swimmer Sawa in collaboration with Rotary Cup of Kuching Central are working on. It was also through this project, it made me felt grateful to the many of the opportunities that was given to me, including the chance to speak here, because there are so many girls and women out there that deserve it, but they are still struggling which is why I wanted to use this presentation as an opportunity, opportunity to increase your awareness on this matter so that we as girls, we can assist each other for a better future. And that will be all from me. So if anyone is interested in supporting our project or if you are interested in knowing more, feel free to contact us via our social media. And I hope you enjoy it and thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Andreso, for sharing with us uh, on her project uh, from Swinburne. Wow, in 2018, 500 million women period poverty due to low income and also access to the sanitary products. Uh, in the project uh, which Andrea shared with us, they have uh, donated sanitary products, but this time it is to on um, disposable uh, pets to young women or students in the low income group. Thank you so much, Andrea. Our third speaker on health and hygiene is interactor Tan Hui Shin, who is currently studying in Form 4 in Batu Pahat, Johor. So over to you, Ms. Tan. Okay, thank you, Dr. Basha. You're welcome. Okay, I hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Inspector San Huishan from Batu Pahat. The topic I will present today is health and hygiene. So, what is the health and hygiene? Health is the normal and healthy state of the body. It is a great source of peace and happiness, health free refer to a healthy state of mind and ability physically fit to have no disorder, illness, or disease. In simple terms, health refer to a person's physical, emotional, and psychological well-being. After that, hygiene is referred to good practice than fever disease 
and lean to a good health, especially cleanliness, proper resources of wastewater and drinking water safely. It's referred to all the activities that are done to improve and preserve maintain good health. Moreover, what is the importance of health and hygiene? In my opinion, keeping a health and hygiene lifestyle can help us prevent from getting or spending germ and infection disease. The germ that cause many diseases can be passed on through touching other people, getting face on your hands, handling contaminated food, or coming into contact with dirty surface or object. Besides, personal habit must, must be consistent. This is involve washing your body every day and caring for yourself. It reduces the chance of body Orders and thus any chance of embarrassment at work or at school. Furthermore, how can we maintain health and hygiene? We must support girls and women with mature hygiene management. We work to strengthen confidence, knowledge, and skill among girls and women to manage their menstruation safely, know what to ask for where they get their period and use clean material and stability. Then, prevent body odors also can help us maintain health and hygiene. After washing, apply the odorant to your armpit, put on clean, dry clothes, work sweaty or dirty garbage well, and if possible, hang them outdoor to dry. If you have a problem with extensive sweating, Make an appointment to see your doctor. Not only this, we must wash our genitals with the right way. Women can generally wash the delicate skin around the vulva with a soft free wash, salt water or pan water. Avoid perfume soap and bath product since this may ir irritate the sensitive skin of the vulva. Do not touch because it upsets healthy bacteria in the vagina. In addition, what is the benefit of getting a good health? Getting a good health can reduce cancer risk. Eating food that contains antioxidants can reduce a person's risk of develop cancer by protect cells from damage. The presence of free radical in the body increase the risk of cancer, but antioxidants help remove them to lower the likelihood of this disease. Apart from this, getting a good health can improve gun health. The colon is full of sexually occurring bacteria, which play important roles in metabolism and digestion. Certain strands of bacteria also produce vitamin K and B, which benefit the colon. These strains also help find harmful bacteria and virus. The diet low in fiber and high in sugar and fat alter the gun microbiome, increase inflammation in the area. At the same time, getting a good health and can also can help us to save money. Learning a lifestyle of healthy behavior along from more money in your pocket by increased work productivity, eradicated doctor visits, and decreased missing work due to feeling ill and unwell. You will have extra fun to do things you love and to your love. This is my this is the end of my sharing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Miss Hui Xin, I pronounced your, your, your name correctly. All right. So, Miss Hui Xin had even explained to us the importance of health and hygiene and how to maintain 
a good health and hygiene. Thank you so much, uh, Hoi Xin. Our next panel speaker on health and hygiene is uh, Ms. Safiana Raza, who holds a master's in pharmacy from the University of Bradford, England. Okay, she comes from Sabah. She is a Sabahan, Malaysia, but is now working is now working in uh, Bradford, having completed numerous locum ships in her field. She was also involved in setting up the one of the first few pharmacy-led COVID-19 vaccination sites in the UK and co-managed at other sites. Over to you, Ms. Safia Narazak. Hello and good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I mean, sorry. sorry, good afternoon there. It's still morning here, sorry for that. Uh, right, so um, let me share with you guys my screen. Um, let me just do that now. Uh, um, just bear with me, let me just do that now. Um, Are you having difficulty, Ita? Um, I think so. I don't know. I think. Are you able to share your screen? Uh, share your slides on screen? I don't think it's working at the moment. If, um, technical team, uh, back up, please. Um, Jess, Jess, can you take over? Can you do it for me? It's just not playing up. Oh, should I join the meeting? Is it, is it working? I'm sorry, guys. We will wait for the technical team to support you. Um, I think you should be able to. Jacqueline? Can you give us a moment? Hand? Give us a moment. All right, good. It's, it's, it's in progress. Right, right. okay. So uh, my topic today will be on women's um, health and community setting. Okay, so, got Yeah, so I will be talking about com uh, common issues uh, when a woman comes to, to see the pharmacies. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So the common issues here, yep, next slide, please. Yep, so whether it's major or minor, it doesn't matter, um, I'm here to help. Normal, uh, common issues are period pain and the satiate pain, uh, morning after pill, issues some pain around the lower part of the body, women hair loss, uh, more and more women are coming in now with some sort of hair problem, um, constipation, depression, uh, sleeping pattern and stress related matter. These are the common issues that I'm, uh, I have been working for five years now. So this is how the common issues that we are, we are trying to like um, talk about here. Um, next slide, please. Um, just next slide. So yeah, obviously we're stronger together. So let me share my experience with you. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, this, um, so this is the solution to the issues. And if I can't help you to solve the problems, I will try and post you to my other um, healthcare professionals who are more than happy to help you. Next slide, please. Um, so obviously with, um, the first issue is the period pain and um, associated pain. So obviously we'll go, with, we'll go through the um, history with you. Is it first time or is that always the, it always the case? Is the pain painful or is it like just a normal kind of pain? We'll recommend with um, suitable pain management. Listen to your body. If the pain is persistent or it gets worse, please get to check out because period pain shouldn't be too painful. It can be discomfort, but if it's like too painful, you need to get it checked out. Uh, we do running after thrill. We do offer that. It could be a taboo um, subject to 
to talk about as well but it's always going to be private and confidential you don't have to be afraid of and um, probably uh, back home in Malaysia and Singapore it could be something that people don't want to talk about uh, because sex education is still a topic that we don't really talk about but um, it's something that is available out there for you to purchase there's two types of pills that is available to purchase the pharmacy you should be able to assist, uh, to assist you in this again like I said it's your body your, it's your own choice um, next slide please Okay, so this um, another issue is that women tend to come in to the pharmacy uh, is regarding this itchiness and pain around the um, lower part of the area, similar to like also PRK. If it's the first time, you have to get it referred to the doctor to make sure that you can get the best treatment. If you experienced it before, like yeast infection, like my previous um, panelist has experienced, we can sell uh, some some cream or oral tablet to help and relieve the symptoms. We can also provide with some um, advice, some um, hygiene uh, advice as well. If it's a urinary um, tract infection, most probably you will experience some sort of like burning sensation when you, when you go to the toilet um, and like back pain area, you will probably uh, need some sort of like antibiotic. Um, I'll have to probably refer you to the doctor because um, over here, we can't sell antibiotics, but probably back home, you can probably purchase it. Uh, that is something like, you know, also women, women tend to get easily affected with uh, UTI as compared to men. Um, it's just that because we have a shorter a ureter as compared to men. Next slide, please. So uh, this is starting to be more common now uh, with hair loss. Uh, I'm seeing Probably as when the pandemic started, more and more people are coming in uh, with some sort of hair problem now. Uh, hair loss is becoming more prominent, I would say. Probably um, switch to a sulfate free shampoo. Um, if it's an underlying, underlying condition, it could be, uh, we will refer you to other healthcare professionals, probably doctors. Um, also, um, could be straight um stress uh, related kind of thing. Uh, that that also we can refer you to the doctors. Another thing that is common as well is constipation. Obviously, constipation we can provide you with some sort of like exercise stuff, changes, in, increase of fiber, increase of uh, fruit, veg intakes, laxity. We can also don't be afraid to like come into the pharmacy. You know, it's it's not like something that you should be afraid of to, to speak to the pharmacies is always like oh we we are not like we are always there to help you out don't be afraid to come into the pharmacy it's never a dumb question it's always we are always here to help out um next next slide please these two topics are very important um uh, depression and sleeping pattern i think this is also a taboo topic to talk about but uh, like I said, we're always here for you. It's always we are always here to like girls and women. But I think it's always we, we tend to keep everything inside. We don't want to be we don't want to be um, seem weak. Um, so, but if I can't help you, I can always signpost you to agencies that help that can help mental health um, agencies or doctors. Mental health is equally important as physical health. Um, there's like sleeping, sleeping pattern and self-related um, matters. Good sleeping hygiene is, is, is very essential for us to function. Um, and a good routine will always help to try uh, better for, uh, for the next day's week in turn, reduce the stress level. Um, that's, I hope, uh, a next slide please. I think that's, uh, can we, yeah, sorry, next slide please. Yeah, so this is just a, a few pictures I want to share. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, um, listening to my speech. I hope um, you don't be afraid to come to the pharmacy to if you guys have any problems. We are all here to help you guys. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Safiana Razak. Um, you have shared some of the common issues on health 
especially among the women and girls. And um, of course, from your experience as a pharmacist. And thank you also for sharing with us some suggestions on uh, or solutions on how to resolve the health issues. Thank you again, uh, Ms. Zafiana. Our final speaker on health and hygiene is Dr. Rector Nor Ileana Azira Zulbaidila. She is a fourth year medical student at the University of Malaysia, Sarawak, Unimas, and is currently in her pediatrics posting at Unimas. She is also the current president of Unimas One Health Student Club. Ms. Nor Ileana will share with us about female hygiene and its importance in health. Over to you, Ms. Elena. Are you okay, Ms. Elena? Oh, yes, yes. I'm sorry for okay, the- Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, a very good afternoon, I to all present. Today, I will talk about a female hygiene is important in health. So these are the objectives of my sharing, which are to understand the importance of female hygiene, to describe the challenges faced by female that lead to the poor hygiene, and to explain regarding the diseases that are related to poor female hygiene. So hygiene is a basic human need, and we know that it's a common sense to practice it in our day-to-day -day life, but the numbers of diseases that are spread by the very lack of this common sense habit is staggering. In order to understand about my presentation today, we need to understand what hygiene and health are. Hygiene refers to behavior that can improve cleanliness and lead to good health, while health is defined as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and is not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. These are the components of personal hygiene, which include body, oral, and so on. And as you can see, based on the topic of our discussion, my main focus for today is menstrual hygiene. Menstrual hygiene is vital to the empowerment and well-being of girls worldwide. It is more than just about the access to sanitary pads and appropriate toilets. It's about ensuring girls live in environments that values their ability to manage their menstruation with dignity. Menstrual hygiene is a part of feminine hygiene, which defined as a general optimism described as a little product used by women with menstruation, the general discharge of other bodily functions related to the cover. I'm sorry, I'm... Even though menstrual hygiene is a very crucial to women, it is still an undeniable fact that menstruation poses particular challenges to young women around the world, including Malaysia. First and foremost is the lack of access to proper sanitation facilities. Over 1.7 billion still do not have sanitation services such as private toilets and latrines. As simple as it may seem, toilet provides safety and dignity to girls to change and dispose their personal care product. A study found that first sanitation facilities primarily occur in school contexts as school was the main institution that they frequented. As a high school student, I myself used to find that school, toilet schools are kind of dirty, which make managing menstruation at school difficult. Secondly, is a lack of knowledge about hygienic menstrual practice. Parents may lack accurate uh, knowledge about proper menstrual hygiene, further limiting the support that they can provide. A study revealed that most participants that had no knowledge of menstruation before the menarche. Most participants had negative emotional response, which characterize that menarche as an unpleasant shock. Thirdly is period poverty. If you would like to talk about period poverty in Malaysia, it may take up hours to discuss about this issue and it's seriously underrated but very concerning topic. Girls will find it more difficult to assess the menstrual supply since the pandemic has happened. Most of this affected come from the underprivileged and disadvantaged household. In Malaysia, an average pack of 16 sanitary pack costs about RN10 ringgit and a pack of 16 tampons costs about RN28 ringgit. And although menstruation is natural biological function, period products such as pet and tampons are often not regarded as a basic necessity. What this means that a family whose income has been hit by the pandemic, the main priority for finding money is to put food in the table. Due to the inaccessibility to proper menstrual product, this girl resort to use tattered clothes, coconut husk, newspaper, and even banana leaf in place of sanitary pet and tampons. Or oh, this unhygienic product and dangerous method can cause severe health issues. Finally, is the stigma and uh, finally is stigma and taboo surrounding menstruation. In many cultures, majority of young women receive message as menstruation was dirty and impure. Menstrual practices are still clouded by taboos and social cultural restrictions, resulting in adolescents girl remain ignorance of the scientific effects and hygienic health practice. 
So one of the repercussions of poor mental uh, menstrual hygiene is dermatitis. So dermatitis is a general term that describes common skin irritation. It involves itchy, dry skin or rash, and it might cause skin to blister, ooze, or uh, like flat of uh, kind of flat off. So friction, excessive moisture, or not changing the pipe frequently can cause this vulva irritation. And secondly, due to the various stigma and taboo surrounding menstruation, young women were restricted from participating in many regular activities. In addition to restriction on worship, there are sometimes advised not to go outside of the house while menstruating. This frequent limited social interaction with peers may predispose them to psychiatric disorders such as depression and anxiety. UTI is the most common health issue related to poor menstrual hygiene. For instance, due to the lack of proper uh, sanitation facilities, they need to wait to use the bathroom. Holding your urine for extremely a long period can predispose you to the urinary tract infection due to the bacteria buildup. And finally, it's reproductive tract infection. RTI are a major public health concern worldwide and particularly common in low-income settings. Unhygienic menstrual hygiene management practice may create abnormally moist conditions in the vulva vaginal area, which may promote a protonitis infection. So RTI includes three types of infection, uh, which is STD, uh, endogenous, and iatrogenic infection. The main concern of uh, poor menstrual hygiene is endogenous infection, which are caused by the overgrowth of normal flora in the presence of a woman's genital tract. For example, is bacterial vaginitis, vulvar vaginal candidiasis, and trachomanus vaginalis. So the burden of untreated RTI is especially heavy for women because this infection are often asymptomatic or the symptoms are not recognizable. Morbidity and mortality related to RTI deprive society of important contribution made by women. This infection and their sequelae, their sequelae are uh, an especially urgent public health problem. These are the sequelae of RTI. Uh, PID is especially a life-threatening condition and it increases the risk of tubal infertility, ectopic pregnancy, genital cancer, and chronic abdominal pain. So, Growing up in a clean and safe environment is every girl's right. Access to clean water, basic toilet, and good hygiene not only keep the girls thriving, but also give them healthier start in life. Safe water, sanitation, and hygiene go hand in hand. One cannot be fully realized without the other. Together, the three are referred as watch. So while the majority of Malaysians can access clean water conveniently for every use, such a privilege is still not available to all, especially around Asli and rural communities in Sarawak. For those who are residing in rural areas, access to any form of water need to be done by uh, traveling a fair distance. As a result of lack of clean water resources, many forced to practice open defecation. Safe water, sanitation, and hygiene at home should not be a privilege for only those who are rich or live in urban. However, there are still many rural communities in Malaysia who have yet to get the privilege of clean water access. Climate change has altered the availability and quantity and quality of global water supply and science. Some Increasing water security is associated with prolonged mismanagement and unsustainable use of water. The water security issue in Malaysia is the concern of people in the whole nation. Recently, water crisis is uh, several states, and several states is crucial, especially in Selangor. Uh, popular growth particularly will limit the amount of water available per person. And urbanization lead to increased pressure on freshwater resources as people become more concentrated in one area. So girls all over the world without access to basic nation and safe water struggle to keep themselves clean. They are placed at additional risk of infection and disease. The diseases caused by unsafe or unhygienic practices decrease the girl's chance to successful school completion and healthy growth. As a president of UNIMAS My Health Student Club, I would like to expose all of you to One Health approach. So CDC uses a One Health approach by involving experts in human, animal, and environmental health, and other relevant disciplines and sectors in monitoring and controlling public health issues. With poor safe water access, the girls are at higher risk of getting diarrhea. In the past, for most people, severe dehydration and fluid loss were the main cause of diarrhea death. So transmission of parasitic disease can occur when they swallow or have contact with the water that has been contaminated by certain parasites. So antimicrobial resistance occurs when the bacteria, virus, fungus, or parasite change over the time. As, as a result of drug resistance, antibiotic and other antimicrobial medicines become ineffective and infection become increasingly difficult or impossible to, try, to treat. Contaminated water and poor sanitation are linked to the transmission of diseases such as cholera, uh, diarrhea, dysentery, hepatitis A, typhoid, and polio. It may also transmit diseases such as dengue fever and leptospirosis, especially in rural parts in Sarawak, 
girls who use river as their water supply are at higher risk in developing leptospirosis. So as a conclusion, uh, building a good personal hygiene, especially for women, is challenging. However, carrying ourselves in the proper manage gives huge benefit to our health. Explain and demonstrate to your friends and colleagues or family to practice a good hygiene. This knowledge may help us to give a better explanation on the consequences of poor female hygiene to our family and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Eliana. You have shared the importance of hygiene uh, with emphasis on menstrual hygiene, which can cause several unhealthy conditions. And of course, you have also highlighted water, sanitation, and health are very important. Thank you, Eliana. Thank you. So let, we have already done the second uh, topic. Uh, it's now the question and answer session. Um, there are two questions that has been posed uh, in this chat box. The first one comes from Alexandria Liang and is addressed to Andrea. Uh, let me read the questions. Hi, Andrea. It must have been difficult to carry out the project during the COVID-19 pandemic. How were you and your team able to overcome the restrictions caused by the pandemic? Andrea, can you respond to this? Uh, hello, Alexandra. Thank you for the question. It was a great one. So you are right about the limitations during the pandemic. But luckily, our project was actually launched near the end of 2021 during the recovery phase. So the XOP wasn't actually that tight as compared with before. But still, there are like communication limitations. So communication is actually a key. We have like different committee members in charge of different worlds. Like for me, because I'm the treasurer, I work, I, I'm in charge of looking for supplier and other committee members, they'll have to work with the school to see like if there are any restrictions or limitations and make sure that the logistic process will go smoothly. And also our advisor, Miss Andrea, not me, we just happen to share the same name. Miss Andrea from RC Cuisine Central, they also advise and help us a lot on the project. So many of the coordination limitations can all be solved quite easily as long as we communicate properly with all the different parties. And because it's like pandemic and we don't go out, we are using like online communication like Zoom or WhatsApp. So all of that, it ensures a very smooth process during the delivery. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Andrea So, so because there are two Andrea here. <laughs> all right. The next question from comes from Ms. Azeline Quadra. Uh, it's addressed to Rotorector Grace. Please be prepared, Grace. It says here, Sex education can be quite a taboo subject. How did your project approach this subject? Grace, are you um, there? Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Rita right. Adeline, for your question. So this is a very re relevant question because in the Philippines, they're actually a very Roman Catholic country. So they are like taboo against such topics. But I think the thing about taboo is that the awkwardness about talking um, about such issues and also the attitude towards the issues. And so like before the event started, we ensured that our facilitators were very open to talk about these things. And we told the participants that it's a very safe space and we are all girls. So we would understand each other, what each other, um, what one another is going through. And so I think it's the attitude and the willingness to break the ice first, um, to be able to talk about um, such issues with ease and openness and also respectfully that um, helps to translate the message very um, smoothly to them. Yep. I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Rotary and Adeline. Um, Dato Tasha, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Rotary the Grace. Yeah, there are only two questions that has been posed in the chat box. Uh, is there any uh, other questions? Let me go through again. Okay. Um, no, there is no other questions. Anyone to raise their hand would like to uh, speak directly? I have another two minutes to go for the question and answer session. Anyone? If I cannot see you because um, please uh, just say hi first. Okay, um, there is no other question. 
Um, so shall we go direct to the third topic? Let's begin the third topic, which is on girls' empowerment on early marriage. Okay, this topic is covered by one man speaker and only one panel speaker. It is a challenge actually to read the main speaker's achievement in one minute. Past District Governor Kalpana Khan covered eight states in Northeast India and eight revenue districts of West Bengal when she was the District Governor in 2005. She is an educator for four decades and a social worker with a focus on peace, education, women empowerment, and livelihoods. PDG Kalpana is also an ambassador in empowering girls covering zones 1B and 6, where she is responsible for advising and designing activities for girls and women's empowerment undertaken by Rotary Clubs in several states of India, as well as in Nepal, Bhutan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. That's a lot of areas to cover, PDG. <laughs> PDG Kalpana will share with us on the girls' rights against early marriage. PDG Kalpana, please. You may start, uh, PDG Kalpana. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, moderator, Dr. Taman. Greetings from District 3240 uh, to the assembly of um, people here, rot Rotarians, uh, Rotractors, Interactors, Inner Wheel members, all uh, here this afternoon uh, to be discussing on a very important topic, and that's empowering girls. Uh, my very good friend, District Governor Dolly, Conference Chair, past President Pali Totiro, President of the Rotary Club of Singapore, Rotarian Lim, past Rotary International Director and Ambassador, Dr. Sawalak Ratanavich, our very effective moderator, Rotarian Dr. Daluk uh, Taman, Datuk Taman, Dr. Rose Nani, Rot uh, Rotarian Imen Edin, members of the Council of Governors, all distinguished speakers, my dear fellow Rotarians and Innerville members, Rotractors, Interactors, teachers, advisors, and friends of Rotary from far and near. Greetings from uh, Dibruga in Northeastern India, in the state of Assam. My topic of discussion this afternoon is the early marriage, the challenge of early marriage. We had seen a picture, you know, which has been uh, shown on Rotary Showcase also, which showed us happy faces happy faces of young girls from all over the world. But this happiness is marred when early marriage takes place. This is a great challenge, a challenge which we are not very much aware of. You know, this is not talked about often. And uh, this is also something, early marriage is not something confined only to the girl child. Of course, the girl child gets the brunt of it more than anybody else. But it is the young male child also uh, who suffers at times. And because uh, many a times you find that the groom in the early marriage, the groom is a young child who has a male child who has not attained an age of maturity. This, uh, our earlier speakers had been very effective in their presentations. And it was so good to listen to young Rotarian and also 
to the retractors and interactors, you know, who were infused with enthusiasm and who were very much interested in this subject. And it is great. I mean, they are the future and it is great that they are thinking about this aspect of human society uh, because some of the reasons are one of the main reason is poverty. Uh, so most of us are privileged to receive a good education and to uh, live in homes, you know, which can uh, aff uh, afford to uh, provide proper education. Uh, but uh, with education also comes certain awareness. And this awareness is often not uh, seen in families which are in the lower, you know, in the poverty level. And also there are certain traditions, certain traditions like family honor, you know, and uh, the certain customs in society. And then again, it is the governance, which is very important because, uh, you know, there has to be proper laws are there. Every country has its laws against early marriage, but these laws have to be enforced and there has to be a political will to do it. And, you know, I uh, had come to know about a lady, you know, whose uh, daughter had passed away and uh, her, a uh, young grandson was 18 years old and he was going to get married to a girl who I was amazed to know was just 13 because there was no woman in the house. Uh, her grandchild and his father were there. There was no woman in the house. So, you know, this girl was going to be brought from another province and she was just 13 years old, a girl who should be playing, who should be in school. And often the, there is a concern for the safety of girls because when they you know it in certain areas, when they think maybe it would not be safe to have the girl till a later age being, uh, being at home, then the parents are in a hurry to uh, marry her off. And of course there are civil registration systems and lack of awareness about what this may lead to, you know, the effects on health, the economic inputs, the girl not being able to uh, earn for herself because her education has not been completed or her health, which we have, uh, you know, uh, there has already been discussion on this, uh, has been affected. Uh, so uh, these are issues, you know, which are very important and which are the root cause. And uh, these figures are very worrying uh, because we find that one third of girls in the developing world are married before the age of 18 and one in nine are married before the age of 15. In certain countries, when I was going through this and, you know, I was trying to get myself into, you know, uh, finding out more about it, I found that in certain countries, you know, uh, it is legitimate also to, you know, for someone to marry, you know, to be married off, not to marry because a girl wouldn't want to get married off at such an early age, to get married off at the, even at the age of, uh, at the age of 12. And if this present trends continue, 150 million girls will be married before their 18th birthday over the next 10 years, over the next decade. And that's an average of 15 million girls each year, something to worry about. And we find that, uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of countries, uh, you know, uh, in Western Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, and due to also their population size, uh, that uh, it, and uh, also you know like countries in certain countries in South Asia, uh, where uh, there is a uh, there is a large number of child brides, and of course another very worrying uh, uh, factor is the present situation, the situation that has come because of COVID nineteen. Uh, you uh, we find that people are suffering financially, parents are suffering financially, many of them are out of work. And uh, the first victim of this becomes the girl child. And even with schools not being regular, and sometimes we found, you know, that uh, uh, girls uh, did not have access to smartphones because the classes were held online and they did not have access to smartphones. Or so they discontinued their studies. And once their studies are discontinued, then, you know, they would, uh, you know, they would be at home. And then the best, next best thing would be for them to get married off. So uh, of the world's 2.2 billion children, every child, third child lives in poverty. So that accounts to 663 million children. Every fifth woman was married as a child. 
and there are 650 million child brides alive today. So these are figures which are really, uh, you know, very uh, worrying and uh, cause uh, for concern. And I would be taking up, uh, you know, uh, the topic one of my presentation would be the laws. And why is it so important to have laws uh, set in place by every country to see that the minimum age of marriage uh, is there to safeguard the boys and girls from being married. As they are not uh, physically, mentally, psychologically, emotionally ready to reach their fullest potential and protect their fundamental human rights. It has been mentioned by one of the speakers that you know, education is a human right. And a girl who gets married, you know, who is taken away from school, uh, she, her human right uh, is not being looked into. So we must definitely say no to child marriage and also ensure in our own ways uh, how we can, uh, what we can do about it. So there are the laws and international mandate. In 2015, the UN member states came together to adopt the SDGs and a set of 17 goals, as you are well aware, were set up and uh, uh, to uh, have a development priorities from uh, then and 2030. And this is an universal call. And this is a call to end action, to end poverty, to take up action to end poverty, protect the planet and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity centered on the realization of human rights. And this goal five aims to eliminate all harmful practices such as child early and forced marriage and female genital mutilations by 2030, which happens in certain countries, not many of course. Achievement of eight of the 17 SDGs is based on ending child marriage. So they go towards ending child marriage and 193 countries have agreed to end child marriage. So they are aware of this menace of child marriage. By 2030, they uh, uh, have this aim of ending child marriage. And there has to be you know, uh, more effective action to uh, you know, prevent child marriage, to stop child marriage entirely. Because when a large part of the world has come together, it's definitely a no to child marriage. So I just went through some of the you know, laws which are there in some of the countries which are covered by your district. And I also found that uh, 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 you know, the, these are some, I will not go into details, but you know, the marriage age for Singapore, Brunei, Sabah, Malacca, and Johar. And uh, one thing that I found was that even though a marriage age is fixed in all the places, you know, but there are exceptions. There are provisions for special licensing. And this is something you know, to worry about because if the, you know, if the, uh, the lawmakers, if the administrators, if the government have come together, if they have decided that there should be a minimum age for a you know, uh, person to get married, uh, at, uh, then uh, definitely you know, there should not be any loopholes to it there should be no uh, provisions for special licensing. That is what was my personal opinion, because as we know, you know, none of these young children are prepared for marriage. And in India too, we find that, uh, you know, all the law is there, uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, the rate of child marriage is something which is a concern. It's a reason for great concern. And uh, uh, there is a provision uh, it's a conditional cash transfer program dedicated to delaying young marriages. So this is what the government can do by providing a government paid bond in her name, in the name of the girl. So that money is going to her. Uh, she will get that money on her 18th birthday, provided she is not married. So, you know, for girls from poor families, uh, you know, this could be, uh, you know, a deterrent to child marriage. And the parents perhaps also would realize that this may be, you know, useful uh, for her later on in life. Uh, but we find that a large number of women uh, are married off at a very early age. 
uh, I would like to share a story. This is a human interest story. It's a, it's a, a story about Happy. Uh, Happy uh, was a girl who was very unhappy when I came to know about her. Uh, she, in real life also, her name is Happy. And today she would have been here if she didn't have other commitments. And I came to know about her from an administrative officer who was there in her district in the Northern Assam district of Dhemaji. And I had come to know that her father did not want her to get uh, uh, to continue her education. He wanted her to get married and he was persistently you know, after her to get married. And she was a girl, you know, very, very, very motivated, very talented. Uh, uh, you can see on the screen a book which she had, you know, the cover of a book which she had written uh, when she was in the seventh grade. Such a talented girl. And she was from a very poor family and she used to write poems and others used to take her poems and publish and, you know, uh, give her money for food. And I came, came to, to know, know about uh, this talented young girl and after she finished her class 10 board exams, we got her over to Dibruga, uh, my, our city of Dibruga, and uh, you know, got her into uh, uh, the school, which is the oldest girls institution in our province. And uh, she finished her higher secondary from there. And now she's pursuing her undergrad studies. And she is so motivated. She would like to be an administrative officer. So if at, at that point of time, you know, if we had not come into the picture, you know, perhaps Happy would have been forcefully married. She would not have been able to pursue her studies, but she is an exceptionally talented girl. And I'm quite sure that one day she is going to fulfill her dream of becoming an administrative officer. Right now, she's also, you know, looking after, uh, she's uh, rearing sheep, she, uh, she doesn't, she's very independent. She doesn't want, uh, you know, financial support right now. And she's, uh, you know, uh, rearing sheep and cattle and paying for her, uh, you know, education. So there are so many happy, you know, who are uh, around, uh, who need to be uh, uh, helped, who need a, a hand of support. Uh, this uh, Gloria uh, is, uh, you know, this organization, Global Citizen, uh, uh, had uh, projected this story of uh, Gloria and uh, she became a bride when she was just 12 years old. There were 10 children, her parents used to go fishing and if they did not catch fish, then uh, they would go hungry. And uh, when her uh, uh, father passed away, her mother was all on her own and uh, she thought the best thing would be to get Gloria married because uh, a 35 year old man came forward and he said that uh, he would pay for her school fees and all the other expenses. And as in her own words, she said that she, she was too young to get married. And she didn't even know about marriage, a 12 year old girl. And uh, you know, her freedom was totally hampered because when she was with her mother, she was free to go around, she, she uh, could do what she wanted. And now, you know, she had to listen to him and uh, 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 what happened, what followed later was that her 35 year old husband uh, passed away and she was pregnant at that time. And uh, then uh, her husband's brother married her and uh, he was very abusive and she lost the child. And uh, later on, uh, she conceived again. And uh, in the meantime, the second husband had also passed away uh, one of her speakers, I think Jasmine, I think had mentioned about uh, young widows. And uh, uh, so uh, she was there with the child and she was uh, 17 when this realization came to her and uh, she had suffered so much in her life. So she had said that she did not want anybody to get married at an early age because things are very difficult and you lose your rights, the basic human rights and one suffers a lot. Just imagine a girl getting married at 12, uh, you know, conceiving twice and, you know, facing abuse and uh, being on her own. Uh, here, what can we do about it? There are many things which can be done. 
And uh, of course, what the economic incentive is there, which I had uh, mentioned about uh, just a few minutes ago. And this awareness is, uh, has to be created. And this awareness can be created by <coughs> us getting together. Uh, Rotarians, inner wheel members, Rotractors, Interactors, um, and also other organizations which think on the same lines. And it is very important that uh, we, uh, that uh, in, uh, education is uh, imparted, the uh, young uh, child, girl child is made aware, not only the girl child, but also the uh, young boy is also made aware about the health rights. And education, of course, is just fundamental. And uh, one has to reach out, one has to reach out and create a mass com campaigns on child rights. There are organizations surely all over the world which are doing it, but what we are doing is not enough. And we need to activate ourselves much more. And uh, legal uh, policies, uh, which I had already touched on are very important. And also it is important that, you know, some sort of punishment, punitive actions are also taken, are also taken against offenders. Uh, you know, when I mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, this 13-year um, uh, girl who was going to marry an 18-year-old boy, then uh, I had asked, uh, you know, this uh, lady who, who told about it, that won't there be some sort of punishment? She said, oh, earlier there was, but now it seems, you know, they are a bit lenient. So the laws have to be enforced. It's very important. And of course, uh, we have to ensure that children get their justice and civil remedies are there and there is safety and protection. Now in uh, action, we have to create hubs for social support for reaching out to children who are vulnerable. Um, and also to work with adolescent and young girls to ensure to enhance their understanding on detrimental effects of early marriage and empower them to make informed decisions. So what has been undertaken a project uh, for education, for sex education in the Philippines, I think this, this falls into line with engaging uh, young people and also create dialogues for societal reforms against child marriage by engaging with religious groups. This is again important. Uh, we have seen how successful it has been, you know, the polio er eradication campaign has been very successful in, in India because there was engagement with religious groups. So I'm quite sure that if, uh, you know, when this uh, question of early marriage, the menace of early marriage comes up, uh, when discussions are had with uh, religious groups, leaders and communities, uh, surely the word can be put forward that uh, there has to be uh, you know, action against early marriage. And uh, uh, young girls dropping out of schools is a very serious concern. I'm just uh, showing you a picture of a Girls on Wheels project, which has been taken up by the Rotary District of Bengaluru 3190, uh, where they have decided uh, to give 1000 bicycles to girls in rural schools. And uh, this would make them much easier you know, uh, to commute to their schools. Uh, roads are often not very good in rural areas. And another thing which is very important, of course, is the you know, program of uh, washing schools, uh, having proper toilets, having uh, you know, the facilities. We had come across a school uh, which our club had done up, the toilets. And the girls were you know, putting, they had put uh, uh, big umbrellas on the door because uh, for two of their toilets, there was uh, no door. So these are uh, things which, uh, you know, young girls, uh, the problems which they face. These are pictures of very happy children, but uh, these children, you know, mostly girls, were out of school. Uh, I had been to the district conference of Nepal, District 3292, and I came to know from the assistant ambassador there, who is a member of uh, the Rotary Club of Biratnagar, 
that uh, during these COVID times, when many children are out of school, uh, they had taken the initiative of going home to home and finding out that what is what are the problems? Why are these young children out of school? And particularly, you see the number of girls uh, is more because normally girls are left out. Uh, they have to come uh, come out of school. Uh, you know, that's the first choice normally. And they had gone uh, and they had worked together with the Rotarians. The Rotarians too were with them and they had gone home to home. They had gone to several villages and they identified their children, uh, the children who were out. And then uh, they also made arrangements. You see, uh, there is a three villa there where the children are there. They made arrangements for their transportation to school. They provided them with school uniforms. You can see their smiling, happy faces. And they also gave them the books and they have ensured, they have taken up the responsibility of uh, ensuring that uh, their education would be completed. Uh, this is a, a slide from uh, the Rotary India Literacy Missions ASHA Korean program. And this is a program where thousands of young children have gone back to school. This is a program, the literacy mission uh, is a program which has been taken up in, uh, by Rotary in India. And uh, this uh, you know, has uh, effectively uh, brought back with the support of the Rotary clubs. Uh, this is Asha Kiran, or it is a ray of hope for children who are underprivileged and who are out of school. And you can see that uh, they, uh, in a particular district of India, they are being brought uh, they have been identified and they are going to be put back into school. Our international leader, a world leader this year, Shekhar Mehta, has said, service is the rent I pay for the space I occupy on the earth. And definitely, as Rotarians, that is also uh, our guiding spirit, our guiding motto, because after all, we are guided by service above self. And perhaps there could be no greater service than touching the lives of young girls or young children who have been affected by many factors, mainly poverty, and who can be raised from the levels which they are in so that they have opportunities for the basic human rights the basic human rights, which would give them their opportunity to be like any other child and not to be burdened down by child marriage. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. It has been a great pleasure to be spending some time today with all of you. And it has also been a learning uh, experience for me. And I'm particularly, uh, you know, very um, uh, happy to see the, uh, you know, the youngsters, the Rotractors and the Interactors, uh, you know, taking an active interest in this uh, subject. And I uh, wish you all the best. Uh, thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you very much, Pidiji Kalpana. Yes, you have already given us some reasons on young or child marriage or young brides including those uh, involving poverty, education, legal enforcement, and customs. It is very interesting to know that in India, the girls are given cash awards if she is not married by, by the age of 18. That could be one of a uh, way of preventing child marriage in some uh, poverty-stricken areas. Yes, we need to prevent early marriage because 15 million girls each year gets married before their 18th birthday. PDG Kalpana had also recommended several actions to prevent young marriage. Thank you so much, PDG Kalpana, for a very informative um, topic on young marriage. My pleasure. Thank you. Our first panel speaker on the girls' rights against early marriage is Interactor Lim Yi Yen. She is currently in Form 4 in high school in Johor. Over to you, Interactor Lim Yi Yen. Thank you, Dr. 
olacak. You may start, Nimiyin. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dasha. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nimiyin. I'm a student of SNK Dagat Science by the Bahad Johor. I'm also an director of my school, Interact Club. Besides, it's an honor to have the opportunity to join this conference. Today, I'm going to share my opinion about girls objecting to child marriage. Can we have the volume to be higher, please? Can yeah, you hear? Yes, a bit higher. What is the meaning of a child marriage? Child marriage is a, is a formal marriage. Yen, can you increase the volume of your speaker? Uh, All right. Your okay. audio is a bit on the soft side. Can can hear now? No, it's still the same. Anyway, you can increase the, the volume. If I put out the earphone, can hear or not? Yeah, but it's soft. I put out my volumes a uh, little bit. Uh. Uh, can you hear like this, the volume, the voice? You speak louder. If you cannot increase your volume, you have to speak louder. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Uh, child marriage is referred to any formal marriage or informal union between a child under age of 18 and adult or another child. Um, the vast majority of the child marriage between girls and men are rooted in gender inequality. According to the legal adulthood, the measurable age is decided as 18 years old, but in some countries and some areas, the measurable age may be older or younger in a given country. Causes of a child marriage Traditional and cultural, family background, lack of education, jurisdiction permit. One of the causes of the child marriage is traditional and cultural. In many societies, parents are under pressure to marry off their daughter as early as possible to prevent them from becoming sexually active before marriage. If a girl or woman has been sexually active before marriage, they will bring dishonor to her family and community because marriage often determines a woman's or girl's status in many societies. Moreover, parents are also worried that if they don't marry their daughter according to the social expectation, they will not be able to marry them off. For child marriage also a route to cementing family <laughs> tribal connections or setting obligation. For example, in the in in some part of Middle East, uh, marrying young girls is a common practice to help the bride's families or set debts or to settle inter-family disputes. Furthermore, poverty is also the main cause of the child marriage because many poor families marry off their daughter at an early age, especially is a strategy for economic survival. It means one person, one less person to feed clothe and educate. In Asia and Africa, the importance of the finances of the time of marriage who also trains to push the families to hurry their daughter to get married early. For instance, in many sub-Sahara cultures, parents get high bright prices for a daughter who is married near puberty. Disadvantages of the early marriage. Um, disadvantages of the early marriage are in uh, in endangered girls' health, increased girls' risk of experiences, domestic violence, affect girls' education. Um, the disadvantages of the early marriage are that it endangers girls' health because child marriage is associated with higher rate of the death resulting from childbirth, unwanted pregnancies, pregnancy termination, and malnutrition of in the offspring. Child marriage increased the risk of psychiatric dis disorder. Um, other than that, child marriage will affect girls' education. If girls lack, lack of the education, they may not able to make their own decision as to whom they want to get married to due to a lack of maturity over what they look for in a man. 
they should spend their time studying and learning so they can get to know themselves better to understand what type of man they should spend their life with. If they get married too early, they may end up getting married to those men who take advantages of them. Way to reduce the likelihood of girls getting married under the age of 18 years old. Educating girls, empowering girls, ready the wider community to stand up for the girls' rights, providing girls and fa their families with income opportunity. The ways to reduce the likelihood of the girls getting married under the age of 18 years old is by empowering girls. Um, every girl has their right to decide their own future, but not every girl knows this. That's why empowering girls are so significant to ending child marriage. When they are confident in their abilities and with knowledge of their rights and supported by peer groups of other employer, employer girls, they can stand up and say no to the injustice like child marriage. In addition, providing families with livelihood opportunity like microfinances loans um, is an effective way to prevent child marriage, hence family uh, will less likely to persist their daughter as economy burdens. Um, I'm going to share another story about child marriage because this story has just uh, been shared from PDG um, uh, the, from the main speaker. Uh, wait. Uh, PDG Kalpana. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share a story about a girl's name, Mary. Mary's mother and her father both passed away in a quick succession, leaving Mary and her five younger brothers and sisters to move in with their elder sibling in an improvised fishing community. She didn't want to get married because she was so young, but when a man approached the family seeking to marry Mary, she accepted because her older siblings couldn't look after all the children. If Mary were to refuse, she would have been forced to leave home, as her family members were unable to take care of her. But with nowhere else to go and no way to support herself, she accepted she just want she was just 14 years old. I hope my life will improve and that I will help to take care of my young siblings. Mary now just 15 years old, tell, um, uh, tell everyone. Uh, but Mary and her husband had no source in, of income. They struggled to provide themselves let alone support Mary's younger siblings. Her husband rarely worked and she spent her days sweeping, cooking and clean, cleaning the dishes. And when Mary was five months pregnant, her husband left and never come back. Terrified, alone and preparing the race to raise a child was still a child herself. Mary didn't know how she was going to manage. She didn't know anything about pregnancy of childbirth. All she knew, all she knew, is that she was far too young to have be having a baby. Even after I had a child, he is now where to be seen. She called. <laughs> I was not yet at the age of becoming of a mother, Mary said. When the time came, Mary's sisters helped her to deliver a healthy baby, but she was reliant on, on other people's help to provide the things she and her baby needed to survive. If, a ma if my mother was still alive, I would have been a school, I would have been school Mary added. She used to tell me to take care of kids who were in school and that next year I will also start school if I were in a school now. My life would, not, would have been different. I may, be, I may have been employed as a teacher. Conclusion um, Child marriage continues to be, to be a preventable practice in many parts of the world. Even though the world is evolving at a fast pace, some regions can't seem to move on with the times. What's sad is the dark reality of the child marriage, which is not consider, considered often, 
Hence, to sum it up, a marriage must be a scare union between two mature individuals and not an illogical institution which compromise the future of our child children. The problems must be solved at the grassroots level, beginning with the ending poverty and lack of the education. This way, people will learn better and do better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lim Yi Yen. Um, you have shared your perspectives on early marriage, including the reasons and the disadvantages of early marriage. You also have suggested uh, to educate the girls, empower the girls, community support, and of course, increase the economy of the family. Thank you so much, Yi Yen. Our second speaker, uh, is not able to join us due to some important commitments that cannot be avoided. What I would like to do here now is to share some relevant laws and statistics on early marriage in Sabah and in Malaysia. Um, PDG Kalpana has already mentioned some uh, 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 one or two laws in Sabah or in Malaysia, but this is what I have gathered, okay? So in Malaysia, there are two legal systems that are applicable in young marriage. The first one is civil law, which is for non-Muslims. And the second one is Islamic law or Sharia law for the Muslims. This also varies from state to state in Malaysia. And in the state of Sabah and Sarawak, an additional legal system is applicable that is the native court or customary laws for non-Muslim who are Bumiputras or indigenous groups. The minimum age for marriage is 18 years old for males and 16 years old for females. The state of Selangor has increased the female age to 18 years old. There are several states who are now pending to increase, but not there yet. So in the civil law, the non-Muslims under the age of 20 year, 21 years old also needs their parents' consent. The chief minister of various states may grant license to marriage if the applicants are between the age of 16 to 18 years old. This is in the civil law. For the Muslims, the Muslim or the Sharia law may grant written permission under certain circumstances. In the customary law, uh, which is applicable to the engineers groups, a parent or legal guardian may give the written consent on the marriage. In actual fact, there is no minimum age on young marriage according to this customary law. Sabah actually had agreed to increase the minimum age to 18, but is yet to be legislated, while Sarawak did not agree. So can you see the difference in the laws that are applicable in uh, Sabah, Sarawak, and the whole of Malaysia? So right now, um, I would like to share statistics that is recorded in 2018, eh? almost 2,000 young marriages were recorded in 2018, and Sabah has the most number, about 15%. 90% of the young marriages are among young girls, okay? So that is just my sharing for those who are uh, interested to know what are the laws applicable in uh, Malaysia, and of course, in particular, in Sabah and Sarawak. So um, I'm looking at the uh, chat box. Uh, so far, there is no questions. Is there anyone with some questions? You may raise your hand, please, or use the uh, hands icon. Is there anyone? Um, I'm not very sure why is the gallery uh, is still on the speaker. Uh, anyone, please, is there any questions? Oh, Please unmute yourself if you are not speaking, or you have not called upon to speak. Is there any questions? I'm looking at the screen now because there is no questions uh, from the chat box. 
it seems that this topic is very well covered by PDG Kalpana. <laughs> Thank you, PDG Kalpana, for a very informative uh, sharing. Um, well, um, I guess um, I shall close this session. We have come to almost the end of the conference. Please give a round of applause to all our speakers on their inspiring shares, please. Thank you, thank you so much to all the main speaker and the panel speakers. Now let me hand over to Pipi Palita to continue with the next session. Over to you, Palita. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pipi Dato, Dr. Tasha. <laughs> okay, I got you properly now. You got uh, it. <laughs> We should really give a big, big round of applause to Dato Tarsha for giving a wonderful job as moderator for this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, right now, the next item is really the word for of our sponsor. I have um, list, listed again here the people who have been responsible for all the backroom work for this uh, afternoon is Rotarian, we have Rotarian Jacqueline Cole, Rotarian Jessica Lim, who is also our Honorary Secretary, Rotarian Ong Ting Yong, Pipi Palita, myself, and our President, Louis Lim, who is uh, anxiously waiting to, to speak. Let me just give a few words about him. Um, right, uh, President Louis Lim started his journey with, Rotary, with the Rotary Movement as an interactor in Swiss Cottage Secondary School, where he became president a long time ago. Not very long time ago. He's still young, but uh, he's losing his hair, but it's okay. <laughs> he commenced his law under undergraduate studies when he became Rotaractor in the Rotary Club, Rotaract Club of Singapore City, where he became vice president in 1995-96. And this is where he got in touch, of course, with Rotary Club of Singapore, because we were the sponsors of that club, Rotaract Club. In uh, November 2011, he finally accepted the invitation to become a Rotarian because he's been so close to our clubs anyway and has been working with us even before he became a Rotarian. He was quickly roped in to be part of the board in three consecutive Rotary years. And within a short span of 10 years after 20, uh, in last year, 2021, he was installed as the president of the Rotary Club of Singapore, the oldest and the biggest Rotary Club in 33, District 3310, whose membership now stands at 203. My dear friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our dear president, Louis Lim, from Rotary Club of Singapore. Thank you very much, PP Perlita. Uh, first, uh, official greetings, Saudika to uh, PRIT Saola, and also uh, good afternoon, DG Dolly, PDG Zaini, uh, PDG Kalpana, PP Perlita, PP Tarsia. Thank you all for such a wonderful conference. And it all begins, of course, with me being empowered by all the female teachers. <laughs> My teacher advisors in Swiss Cottage were all females. And then uh, they had also, you know, assisted through the, uh, you know, the, the efforts in making Rotary visible as teachers advisors, they, they were all in the, so Swiss Cottage is also under the same sponsorship of RCS. So uh, my movement with RCS started with uh, Swiss Cottage, not just as a road tractor. And over the years, of course, we have seen so many wonderful changes to Rotary to empower females. And PP Perlita is one of those that, one of the early Rotarians. And you look at her, you know, She's close to my parents' age and look at her active involvement, look at her energy, look at PDG Kalpana. My God, this is what we call empowerment. Where else can we see all this except through this conference today? We have the first DG in District 3310 with us here today, and that's DG Dolly. And the next district governor for 3310 is also a lady, Joanne Kam. So ladies and gentlemen, or just one or two gentlemen, the rest are ladies. Empowerment is here in Asia and we are proud of it. And we want to see more women being empowered to do greater things. And I think this is the right way to move. 
conference on empowering girls for a sustainable future. I'm glad that we have moved slightly away from sustainable always equals to you know uh, environment because sustainable is also about the humans and the humans include in a large part the females and uh, statistically uh, in the local university here in Singapore our females outnumber the males and we are still proud of it in fact all the males are very proud of it the males are taking a back seat and we are happy to let the woman lead so with that I would like to you know, thank all the interactors, the Rotaractors and the Rotarians that have logged in. It's a very proud day and we want to thank DG Dolly for giving RCS the opportunity to host this. And uh, we thank everyone who is here. Looking forward to meeting up with you, uh, either if you're coming on the 13th to the 15th of May, when uh, our right President Sheikha Mehta will be here in Singapore. Or if you are joining us for next week, which is the installation of the new governor, that, uh, that's 19th of April. Okay, we look forward to seeing you nevertheless, someday, sometime, sometime soon. Okay, thank you very much, PP Perlita. Thank you very much. I think we should just hold on a little bit because we have got a final take picture taking. Oh, just a minute. I just want to tell everyone that I was uh, the first female president of the Rotary Club of Singapore too. Yes, yes. Forgot. Forgot to mention. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can we now put all our videos together, please, for our final photo taking? Yes. Uh, be sure we have our visual background and our best smile. Okay. Uh, right. Gallery. Yeah. yeah. We go to the gallery and... Uh, Right, we give uh, Rotary and Jacqueline a, a couple of minutes to do this. Okay, everybody smile because you don't know which block you're going to get into. Okay, I think we are all ready. So we have three three pages. Okay, so just keep your smile on. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay, and the second one, second page. One, two, three. Smile. Okay, the final page. One, two, three, smile. Yeah, got it all. Okay. What do you PP Palita? Right. Yes, I think uh, uh, it leaves me now to just to say thank you to everybody. To everybody who's had to wake up early morning because we have uh, participants from the UK, from India, from all over East Malaysia, uh, Sarawak, Sabah, and uh, where else? <laughs> well, of course, uh, Singapore and Johor. And, India. Uh, oh, yes, India. Yeah, we had <laughs> India, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so we are very much uh, indebted to you, PDG Kalpana, uh, Dato Rosnani, and of course, our own very own Rotarian, Iman, uh, for leading the main topics for today and for all your babies rotarians to be all the panelists who have joined us today congratulations and best wishes to everybody all the best okay thank you thank you thank you everybody. thank you thank you thank you thank you RID, Dr. Sawalak, sorry, without you, we would not have had this. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, set it up. Uh, it was great. Yeah, but you were there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Bye. Bye. Yes. Yeah. See you all again. Thank you, everyone. Sure. Only our retractors would like to be connected with one of your clubs. Oh, definitely. Uh, so, yeah, so maybe President Lim can help out. Uh, Akanksha, who asked a question in the first session, you know, she is a Rotractor from the Rotract Rotra, uh, Rotra Club. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Club. So that's they would good. like to have a cultural exchange virtually. Please. Yes, let's have it. I think uh, P.P. Brian Tan has a committee looking at this. Right, right. Good. So true. The youth, yeah. Yeah, I have always uh, already forwarded the yes, request to you. DG Dolly.
because Dili, DG Dolly is somebody who is traveling a lot virtually. You know, sometimes <laughs> for a meeting, she's up at midnight, Singapore time. <laughs> DG <laughs> Dolly is climbing the mountain uh, this week, right? I know. <laughs> on I Thursday, on next Monday. week. On she's Thursday. Practicing. She's practicing. Yes. Yeah. I also <laughs> would like to acknowledge PP Brian from Raffle City, who yes. actually has the largest uh, empowering girls project on this in district 3310 because she's got a global grant worth uh, 60,000 US dollars and it's supported by several clubs, several Rotary clubs, several um, districts, actually district funds funding his uh, project. So that's wonderful, uh, PP Brian. All the best thank to you. Thank you, thank you, PP Brian. That's for thank what? You, uh, PP Brian. Thank you, President Lewis. Thank you, DG. Yeah. Good to see all of you. Yes. Hello, Grace. Yes. Audrey, thank you, Andre. All the best. Yeah, thank you, thank yeah, you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad for my class. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> so long, Bye. Yes, thank now. you, Louis. Oh, yeah, you yes. need to book up Puasa already. Yes, oh, yeah, I oh, have yeah. to. Two hours yeah. long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>